Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidi al-Mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh This um, particular presentation should endure several weeks is called the ethical foundations of Sharia It's actually given at MCA maybe someone was there Nothing is ever the same even if you do it twice and so what it's designed to show is that the Sharia, our Sharia, which we should all take great pride in uh, because uh, it involves one of the greatest projects in human history and it also involves the sum total of the divine design for human life in this world. So we should, we should take pride in it. So we'll explain uh, what we mean by the ethical foundation by looking at the definition of the terms. So the ethical foundation of Sharia, uh, ethics provides a standard for right and wrong. And as Muslims, our ethics begins with spirituality. If there's no spirituality, there's no ethics, because without spirituality, there's no God. There's no knowledge of self, because knowledge of self isn't knowledge of this. That's part of it. And by knowing that, we can see the wisdom of Allah Ta'ala in creating this, by giving us hands with the ability to grasp and the ability to manipulate fine instruments, unrivaled in all of creation and the eye, the eye itself, and the miracle of the eye. So we can see within ourselves indications of Allah Ta'ala's purpose, and Allah Ta'ala's wisdom, and Allah Ta'ala's uh, ability to create in the most perfect fashions. But knowing this, per se, will not in and of itself lead us to know Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. So it can be a means, but ultimately, knowing that uh, inner aspects of our being, what some of our scholars call al-jawahir al-ruhaniya, so the, the spiritual jewels that we possess. And those spiritual jewels are sometimes referred to as the aql, the qalb, the nafs, the ruh. Those are the things that allow us to really know our Creator because those are the things that transcend physicality and our Creator transcends physicality so physical, our physical nature will only take us so far in terms of really knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we can know Allah uh, and then we can know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but we can't, we can't see Allah so our physical eyesight will only take us so far. We can see the signs of Allah's ta'ala power, of the power of Allah ta'ala. فَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ أَثَارِ رَحْمَةِ رَبِّكُمْ Look at the effects of your Lord's mercy. So we can't see Allah ta'ala, we can't see His mercy. We can see the effects of His mercy all around us. And that can lead us to belief. But in terms of really actualizing our belief. تحقيق Al-Iman, wa rububiyya wa uluhiyya Actualizing faith, actualizing our awareness of Allah Ta'ala's divinity, actualizing our awareness of Allah Ta'ala's Lordship, that moves into a realm beyond physicality. Because we can't see Allah, we can't touch Allah. It's our physical senses, right? We can't hear Allah per se. Oh, we're not Musa alayhi salam. And so our physical senses only take us so far. But through our ruh, through our nafs when it's refined, through our qalb, not this physical lump of flesh, but the uh, subtle properties that are associated with it, through that we can actualize our knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by actualizing our knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can have an agreed upon standard of right and wrong. So metaphysics, 
moving beyond physicality in terms of our nature unlocks the access to the spiritual world, the world of the Ruh, that came from Allah, not a part of Allah, but came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And unlocking that allows us to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in knowing Allah ta'ala, we can come up with an agreed upon standard of morality. And that's an aspect of Tawheed. And one of the aspects of Shirk it is a plurality of ethics. So you believe something's right based on your intellect and your understanding, the next person, the next person. The Nazis believe it's right and proper to, to kill off not only the Jews, but the Jews and the Gypsies and the, uh, the Poles and the Russians. Far more Russians died in the Second World War as a result of the Nazi atrocities than Jews. But all of these people, Hitler, they're right. They're, he's, I'm right to kill them. They're inferior people. They don't deserve to live if they can't survive on their own merits. So it's, it's very important for us. And then the next person, oh, Hitler's wrong. And the next person, well, I don't know what's right or wrong. And so we began to, a plurality of eth uh, of. of of ethical standards, this is one of the byproducts of shirk, because people have a plurality of gods that they worship. So one person's morality is defined by money. So I'll do anything to get a dollar. And whatever brings me a dollar is right, and whatever leads to my dollars being taken away is wrong. And nation structure foreign policies on that philosophy. Another purpose person, it's it's sex. I'll do anything to have a sexual thrill, be it pornography, bestiality, sodomy, and that defines right or wrong for that person. But metaphysics allows us to know Allah Ta'ala so we have a universal access to a universal standard. It usually prospers without the state. And we have many uh, historical Example of that. So when we associate Sharia with the equivalent of constitutional law, then we distort what Sharia is by emphasizing legal rulings only. Now, let me be clear. Legal rulings are part of Sharia. So we have to be clear about that. But Sharia is more than just legal rulings. So these anti-Sharia people they try to present Sharia as uh, this law that's going to replace the Constitution, which they don't believe in anyway, especially when it comes to Muslims. I mean, these people are a bunch of hypocrites. That's why Muslims should never back down or feel inferior or be put on the defense by these ruthless hypocrites. They believe in constitution. What happened to the Holy Land Foundation? Their lives were ruined. They're charitable for, for giving charity to the same organizations that the Red Cross and the USA gives charity to in Palestine. And then they're exonerated. So we try them again. And the second trial will bring an anonymous Israeli who's not even a U.S. citizen, it could have been a robot, it could have been the male voice from your GPS. We don't know who testified against them in secret. So their Sixth Amendment rights were thrown out the window. Sixth Amendment, uh, an accused has the, has the right to confront and question their accuser. They had no right, and the accuser wasn't even a U.S. citizen. That's the extent these hypocrites believe in the U.S. Constitution. They're hypocrites. They're human rights, human rights. Right? Human rights. Do Palestinians have human rights? 
what's happening this week in the Palestinian context. We should talk about it. We're so, we've been beat down so bad. Thirsty. Leaving. Oh, time to go. Oh, the kids go. It's bedtime. The Palestinians are making an appeal to be recognized as a, as a, a non-member state in the United Nations to have the status of the Vatican. If they're a non-member state, they become a member of the International Criminal Court in The Hague. If they're, if they're a member of the, non, of the International Criminal Court in The Hague, they can prosecute Israel, prosecute Israel for their brutal, Genocide. inhumane, genocidal treatment of their people. So what's the United States doing? They're blocking it. They're saying we're going to veto it unless you drop membership in the International Criminal Court. That's what these hypocrites are doing. Allah Musta'an. Amen. So these are the people, oh Sharia is bad. So conflation of the Sharia with the state. How how did this come about in the Muslim world? Like, if we have a Muslim state, we have to have Sharia. The two are conflated together. Runs uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, and through Ibn Taymiyyah, this not being prejudiced. Ibn Taymiyyah was a great scholar, but it's just looking at a historical fact. And then from Ibn Taymiyyah, the Wahhabi movement, from the Wahhabi movement, 20th century reformers like Abu Ala al Maududi. So Ibn Taymiyyah, he wrote a book called As Siyasat al Shari'iyah. As Siyasat al Shari'iyah. Or you could say uh, divinely legislative politics. And through that prism began to conflate Sharia with the state. Whereas writers before him, when Mawardi or Abu Ya'la al Mosqabi wrote about the political structure of the Muslim state, what did they call their books? Before Ibn Taymiyyah, called their books Al Ahkam al Sultaniyyah. Al-Ahkam al-Sultaniyah, rulings associated with power, with political power. So rulings associated with political power, there's no Sharia in there, as opposed to a siyasat al-Shari'iyah. So this conflation wasn't always there. Now we mentioned this for the following reason. If a Muslim cannot follow Sharia outside of an Islamic state, how did Muslims exist in China for 1400 years as a minority who never had political power, but they prospered generally, especially on the Yuan and Ming dynasties, and in more recent years as a community? They weren't Muslims, they weren't true to Islam, they weren't adhering to the best of their ability to the ideals of Sharia. They were building masjid, they were maintaining regular prayers, they were uh, slaughtering their animals according to the rules put forth by Muslim law. They were reading Quran, they were going to Hajj, they were paying their zakat, but they never had a state for 1400 years. We don't have a state here. We're not living a Muslim life. There are things we're not doing, but as a minority community, we're not enjoined to do them. Because those things are associated with Ahkam al Sultaniyah. They're associated with a Muslim ruler and not with the laity. 
So another conflation, so Sharia is oftentimes conflated with the state. Another conflation is conflating Sharia with the Hudud. What are the Hudud? Divinely legislated punishment. Hudud. If you look at a book of fiqh, now, and the, the fiqh books are called fiqh books. They're not called sharia books. And fiqh ala al-madhahib ala al-madhahib al arwa It's not called sharia ala al-adha ala al al arwa Fiqh al-sunnah. It's not called sharia al-sunnah. Al-fiqh al-manhaji. Al-Madhab Imam al-Shafi'i. Well, if you look at one of these compilations, let's say the Hashia of Ibn Abidin. Which Madhab is that? Hashia of Ibn Abidin. Imam al-Shafi'i. No, Hanafi. <laughs> Hanafi. Allah. These are long. How much of that deals with Hudu? This is Kitab al Tahara, wa Salah, wa Siyam, wa Zakah, wa Hajj, wa Nikah, wa Talaq, wa Jihad, wa Buyur. Ya Latif. Etc. How much of that deals with Hudu? So, punishment for adulterer, punishment for the wine drinker, punishment for the thief, punishment for Hiraba, the highway robber. How much of that? Five pages. Maybe, maybe, not five, maybe more than that, maybe this much. So all of the Sharia, the ideal that this fit represents, all of this becomes completed Sharia. But the problem should be obvious, I mean. All of the wisdom, all of the scholarship, all of the intellectual endeavor becomes conflated with a very small fraction and then interpreted based on what? Based on some fools in Pakistan or Nigeria or somewhere halfway around the world. That's a problem, because what gets lost? What gets lost is legal philosophy. What is the philosophy governing all of that? That gets lost. 
legal scope. So the scope of legal thinking isn't just that, it's all of that. So that scope gets lost. Legal flexibility. So even in this regard, you never hear some anti-Sharia person talking about how Omar suspended the punishment for theft during the time of famine. Or if a person uh, hasn't stolen a certain uh, quota above a certain limit, there's no punishment. Or how the judge is encouraged to push away any punishment by any ambiguity at all that exists in the case. So all of the, the legal flexibility is lost. So the conflation of Sharia and the, and the state, what well, gets lost? Reason. In other words, this is a rigid mechanical relationship. And there's no role for reason or any uh, intellectual input. Gradualism is lost. The fact that people have to learn. Uh, students of fiqh, there's some here, you read over and over that this ruling is applicable except for someone who's new in Islam. So they don't know this. This is inapplicable for them. So that gradualism is lost. Pragmatism is lost. So the practical nature of Sharia, which involves wisdom, that's lost. And the biggest thing is ethics. The understanding that this system is built on a foundation of principles whose ultimate objective is to guide our actions so that we do that which is right and avoid that which is wrong based on the standards of our Lord, not based on our standards. This is something Muslims have always understood. So, we're going to move now into some specifics related to our topic. We call these the high fives. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. We're going to continue, inshallah, with this uh, presentation, the ethical foundation of Sharia. Now, we reiterate and emphasize that the whole point we're making is that the Sharia system is wider than rulings. So, it's part of a larger system. So this is the point we were trying to make last week in our introductory uh, remarks. And so we're not denying that law and specifically legal rulings are an integral part of Sharia. So we're not dismissing that. But what we're saying is that these rulings, they occur in a context. And unless we understand that context, then it's very difficult to understand the nature of the rulings. So what people here, critics of Islam in this society do, they take a ruling, but they take it out of its context. And because it's taken out of its context, uh, it's very difficult to understand, and it can even lead to confusion, or it can, even, it can lead in some instances to repulsion. So people are repulsed by a particular ruling that's taken out of, out of its context. So the contextualizing of the rulings that 
are an integral part of the Sharia are based on what we're referring to as the high fives. Right? High five. Right? All the little kids, they know the high five. They don't want to talk to you, they say high five, and then they start smiling and they open up. So the first are the five pillars of Islam. So we're all familiar with these and we'll come back to those. And that's obviously the Shahada, the Salah, Zakat, Ramadan, fast of Ramadan, and the Hajj to the pilgrimage. So this is the first of the fives. So we have five pillars in the religion. We have five legal values. And again, we'll come back to the, these, but very quickly the five legal values being that something is either obligatory, it's highly encouraged, it's permissible, it's highly discouraged, or it's forbidden. So you have five uh, values, and we'll, we'll talk about those in great detail. And then we have the five universals, and again, we'll come back to these. Uh, harm is to be removed, hardship, um, uh, uh, cause for facilitating ease, al adam uh, custom and convention has legal weight. Uh, Al-umur bi uh, affairs are judged based on their objectives, their ultimate objectives. Uh, and there's another one, but inshallah escapes me right now. I might have said it. Anyway, but we're going to come back to this in detail. We have the five, actually, the five universals are the preservation of life, preservation of deen, religion, life, intellect, family, and private property, some say honor, then the five legal maxims actually, what I mentioned, harm is to re be removed, uh, hardship, cause for facilitating ease, etc. And then we have the five great prophets of the Ulul Azam, and we'll discuss their mission in the context of the greater system of law. So these are the high fives, five legal, five pillars, so that's five, five values, ethical values specifically, five universals, five great legal maxims, and the five great prophets, alayhim as wassalam, who are referred to as ulul azm, fasbri kama sabaru ulul azmi min al rusuli. So we start with the five pillars. The five pillars are the foundation of our actions. So when the uh, angel Gabriel, Jibreel alayhi salam, came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked him about four things. So he asked him, Fakhbirni, if he asked about five, we could have included it in the high fives. But then there would be six fives. So uh, he asked him about فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ Islam. Inform me about Islam. Or in other words, what do I have to do to be a Muslim? So someone comes and uh, I want to know about Islam. So you tell you have to pray. Muslims, we pray, we fast, we month of Ramadan. We do certain things. We don't eat this, we don't eat that. We can eat this, we can eat that. So what can I do? فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ iman. Inform me about faith. What do I have to believe? So, Islam, the actions. Iman, the beliefs. Fakhbirni anil ihsan. Ihsan, the state of being. In other words, for when the Prophet Sallallahu said uh, in response, Fakhbirni anil ihsan, and ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarahu, fa in lam takun tarahu, fa innu yarak that you worship Allah as if you see Him, and if you fail to see Him, be mindful that He observes you. In other words, this is the description of a state. I'm in a state of awareness. So, Ihsan is about those states that a believer should be in. And then he said, فَخْبِرْنِ عَنِ السَّاعَةِ Inform me about the doomsday, the, the end. And again, this is, so, Islam, what we have to do. Iman, what we have to believe. Ihsan, what we have to embody in terms of our internal states. Asa, 
what do we have to prepare for? We have to prepare for the end. We have to prepare for our death. We have to prepare for the sa. So anyway, the five pillars, these are the foundation of our actions. So as we all know, the first of these is the shahada declaration of faith, which is the action of the tongue. This is why it's included. So this is the action. We have to say it. If a person believes it, but doesn't say it, they're deemed or judged to be a believer with Allah, but their ruling in this world is the ruling of a disbeliever because they didn't utter it. And tashhada and la ilaha Allah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the salah, the formulaic prayer, so as opposed to dua, where we pray or supplicate, the salah is a certain formula. What we say, movements that are done in sequence, the zakat or the poor do. The psalm, the fast of Ramadan, and the hajj or the pilgrim, pilgrimage. Now these are the foundations. These are, what are these called? They usually say, these are the pillars. pillars, or in Arabic, the arkan, arkanul islam. So the pillars are the foundation. We build on that foundation. So that foundation is not the house. We should always remember that. The foundation, if we're sincere and we do these things diligently and our intention is pure, with Allah's mercy, inshallah, we'll, we'll enter paradise. But if we want to embody uh, in our actions that which is built on these foundations, we have to do more. So for example, they're not foundational but our ethical practices in terms of, uh, not ethical, I should say our uh, character traits, if you will. So, ayyul Islam afdal. So the Prophet is asked, which manifestation of Islam is best? فَقَالَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ أن تقرأ السلام أن ت أن تطعم الطعام وتقرأ السلام على من عرفت ومن لم تعرف. Which manifestation of Islam is best that you feed people and you greet people those you know and those you know not. So he says this is a manifestation of Islam, a manifestation of action. So all of the hadith of this type or verses in the Quran where it's describing something associated with Islam. So, ayyul islami. So, which manifestation of Islam, afdal, is best. So, this is an aspect of Islam, but it's not foundational, but it builds the house on top of the foundation. So, all of us should be about the work of building the house. The second are the five ethical values that we can mention here. And then, uh, faith we didn't mention because number one it's not an action per se and so therefore it's outside of the purveyance of law whereas uh, feeding people all of those are actions so those would be included and governed by sharia whereas faith we use say sharia and uh, aqidah and then haqiqa. So these two wings, the bird needs to fly, sharia. So the law, but all of the things that contextualize and give meaning and purpose to the law. Aqidah, the beliefs and the system of, of beliefs and things a, a, a believer has to affirm. And then haqiqa, one cultivating their inner state to provide the balance. And the hadith of Jibril mentions that. When he says, Akhbirni an al Islam, so this sharia is what governs our actions. Akhbirni an al Iman, this is belief, aqidah, what governs our belief. Akhbirni an al Ihsan, this is our state of being, this is haqiqah. So those things related to those metaphysical aspects of our being. So when he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Ta'abud Allah, Ka'annaka Tarahu, Fa'illam Takun Tarahu, Fa'innu Yaraq, Fa'innahu Yaraq, 
that you worship Allah as if you see Him and if you fail to see Him, be mindful that He sees you. As we said, this is a state, but that state of awareness if it's focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarahu ka'annaka tara Allah fa'in lam takun tarahu fa'innahu yarak so it's focused on the worship Allah and ta'bud Allah as if you see him and if you fail to see him be mindful that he sees you so it's Allah 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 all these pronouns refer back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is an indication that this aspect of, of uh, being, if you will, takes us to a, a level within our hearts and within our souls that opens the door to the true experienced knowledge of the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it takes us back to the spirit which Allah placed in us and it's beyond this world it's not a part of Allah's created a ruh makhluq laysa bi hadith laysa bi qadim afwan laysa bi qadim wa hadith muhdath makhluq but it's from Allah he breathed into him something of his spirit, the spirit that he created. That's beyond this world. That is the pathway for us to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who's beyond this world. So it's not a part of Allah, but it's a key within us. And so that's a, another realm beyond this scope for discussing here. The five ethical values are the foundation of our religious consciousness. So when we talk about the things we'll mention, something being forbidden, uh, highly encouraged, permissible, highly discouraged, our, our observing and leaving our, living a life in the light of our awareness of these values cultivates con uh, a religious consciousness within us. To make that clear, the average person who's not a Muslim and is not a believer in God, or they might say they are, but they, it, their belief doesn't impact on their life from moment to moment. That person has no religious consciousness. So when they uh, do something, they don't think about whether it's permissible and with, with Allah Ta'ala, with Almighty God, or if it's impermissible, if it's haram or it's halal. So their, their first thought, a true believer, their first thought is, is this permissible? Is, is this permissible? Is this forbidden? Whereas someone who has no religious consciousness, they might say, uh, is this going to hurt me? Or is it going to hurt someone else? Or am I going to get caught? I do it because it, it seems to be bad but can I get away with it so there's no consciousness of Allah there's consciousness of self is this going to hurt me there's consciousness of, of the police am I going to get caught if I take it anyone watching there are the cameras in here there's consciousness of the camera but there's no consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when the believer, so a person goes to the store, say, oh, persimmons. They say, are, are they ready to eat? They squeeze on them a little. The, the believer goes to, or do, am I allergic to them? Will they give me a stomachache? The believer goes to the store, picks it up, and starts reading the label. And is it halal? That's consciousness, that's religious consciousness. That's religious consciousness. Is this pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? So we mentioned uh, these five values of the obligatory, the wajib. So, and why is, it, why is it ethical? Ethical are principles that establish right and wrong for us. Principles that govern right and wrong. So if something's obligatory, we know it's 
fit and proper, but also it has a reward. And that reward indicates that is something good to engage in. So the obligatory, if we do it, we're, we're rewarded, and if we leave it, we're punished. So a lot of you have been through this before. That which is highly encouraged, mustahab or mandub or sunnah. So if, I, if one does it, one is rewarded, but one leaves it, they're not punished. So, for example, uh, the duha prayer. It's highly encouraged. But if you don't pray your duha prayer, you're not punished, you're not judged to be sinning. So it's definitely an important part of our religious regimen, but if we leave the duha prayer, no one says, oh, you're sinning, and you're, you're liable to be punished. The permissible, mubah, this has no reward or punishment associated with it in and of itself. But it can become something that's rewarded. If something permissible, so it's permissible to eat persimmons. Alhamdulillah for this wonderful gift. I love persimmons. We all do. I never found a person that doesn't like it for some. Squirrels also like them. <laughs> and birds. So, if I just take one of these bismillah and eat it, it's permissible. I'm not rewarded for that or I'm not punished, punished for it. But if I take one of these and I say, Ya Allah, I intend through eating this to strengthen myself so I can worship you more vigorously. Now it becomes rewarded because I've, I've, with my intention to use it as a means to worship Allah, it becomes an act of worship. So as the scholars say, بِالنِّيَاتِ صَرَّةُ الْعَادَاتِ ibadat. With good intentions, ordinary actions, such as eating persimmons, become acts of worship. And then they become uh, something that's rewarded. And then something permissible, if we overindulge it with it, can lead us also to something highly disliked. So it's like people who excessively watch television. Sooner or later you'll see something for, forbidden to look at. So if, based on the ruling of those who say it's permissible to watch television, some have more strict ruling, especially when it first came up. So it's mubah. But one watches, and they're watching fornication, they're watching people's aura, they're watching all of these things is forbidden to look at. So that permissible thing leads them to that which is disliked or possibly forbidden, and so therefore it can become something uh, discouraged. The makruh, or highly discouraged, is something that if we do it, we're not punished, but if we leave it, we're, re we're rewarded. So it's the opposite of the mustahab. Mustahab, if you do it, you're rewarded. If you leave it, you're not punished. Here, if you leave the discouraged, highly discouraged thing, one is punished, uh, one is, uh, not, is, is rewarded, rather, and if one engages in it, one is not punished. But we should be very, very careful with... Uh, because if we know Allah Ta'ala, when we say makruh, makruh and man, for example, with who? Say, have a who, who dislikes it? Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So, what are we doing to our hearts when we constantly engage in something we know Allah Ta'ala dislikes? We're hardening our hearts. We're hardening our hearts. That's why one reason is said, Yani, La Sahirata Ma'al Isra. There's no lesser sin if you persist in it. Because you persist, you persist, and the heart becomes hard, then one falls right into the major sins. Because one's become immune to one's disobedience. One develops immunity, right? The drug addict, they keep using the drug, using the drug, using the drug, and then 
It doesn't affect them anymore. And that's the one of the uh, tor tortures of addiction. The, the addict needs more and more and more just to get the same jolt. And then eventually, there's nothing. There's no jolt. They just need the drug so they don't go through the cold turkey, through the withdrawal, the pain. And so the same with sin. We sin, we sin, we sin, even though it's a minor sin. But bigger and bigger sins start to work their way in, just as the addict needs more and more of the drug. So there's more and more sins inundate our heart until our hearts die. And the haram becomes easy to engage in. And this is how shaitan, shaitan, he doesn't try to get us. Most people. <clears throat> shaitan doesn't start here. Because he knows most, most Muslims aren't going to eat a, a pork sandwich smothered in bacon with bread made with large shortening. Like, shaitan is not going to get you to eat that. Shaitan isn't going to get you to eat a pickled pig foot. He, he knows it. He's like, hey Muslim, here's a pickled pig foot. Really? Mm, yummy, yummy. So he doesn't start here, he starts here. With the permissible things. Why? Because if he can get us to just in our time watching television. No sin. Says, no sin. But we're not doing something that will earn us a reward. So Yom Al-Qiyamah we come up a little bit short. Man, I wish I would have been reading Quran while I was watching football all day on Saturday and Sunday. Some people. Watch the college games all day Saturday, the professional games all day Sunday. Shaitan is like, <laughs> keep going, go 49ers. <laughs> and then Monday night, and now they have Thursday night, right? They have Thursday night. And think the hours, week after week, for like, what, 20 weeks? Week after week, how many hours? So shaitan's like, yeah, it's a fatah, it's the haram, it's the haram. And then we come up with, so he tries the haram, but he said, no. Nah. He tried to get us with the discouraged, to harden our hearts, so we'll fall into the haram. But he says, oh, this is a tough one, to just get him with the mubah. So that the hours go by, and we're not doing anything to earn edger and reward for our, our souls. And Yom al Qayyamah, we might come up three hours short, five hours short. Wallahu alam. So we should be very aware. The bottom line, though, is that as we live our life in the awareness of this scheme, it cultivates a religious consciousness because we don't, I don't want to do haram. This is very important because our environment and our society pushes us to discard this sort of arrangement. So we don't think, we just caught up in the spirit of the society, the spirit of, of consumerism, the spirit of, of possession, the spirit of selfishness and egoism. And so we're only thinking about me, myself and I, what I can own, what I can buy, what I can possess, what I can affix to the labels on my clothing, and this, that, that comes to dominate our consciousness. And so we have materialistic consciousness. So this, this scheme also, in creating a religious consciousness, it connects us with that metaphysical world, that world beyond this. So we're not reading the labels, is this halal? Is this halal? Can I eat this? For any material outcome, we're, we're reading the label because we're thinking of Jannah. We're thinking when we'll stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who fears the time, they will stand before their Lord. 
So that living a life in this awareness of these things, it connects us to that realm beyond the physical. But when we discard this, then we become slaves to the material and we forget the metaphysical because we're so chained to the physical. And it's, it's, it's significant, it's significant that when Allah Ta'ala at the beginning of the Qur'an describes the believers that he can kitabu la raiba fi hudan lil muttaqeen alladheena yu'minuna bil ghayb wa yuqimuna as-salaa wa mimma razaqnaahum yunfaqoon The first thing he says about those people, they believe in the unseen. Alladheena yu'minuna bil ghayb And so this is what, this is one of the things that keeps our consciousness connected to the unseen. So this is why we say it's the foundation of religious consciousness. Then we have the five great universals. So these are, and so this is the foundation of our legal philosophy. In other words, the law, the law system, the system of rulings. What is the philosophical underpinning of that system? So this is one of those philosophical underpinnings, these five things, because they tell us uh, what the logic of the law is, and we'll, we'll illustrate that inshallah ta'ala. So the first and foremost is preserving re religion, hifdud deen. This is before every other consideration, even before the preservation of our lives, because if we're called on to die for the sake of our religion, then we, we readily make that sacrifice. So a person like uh, puts us in a situation. There's, there's, this is a situation where it's lawful to dissimulate. So taqiyya becomes lawful. But there could be a situation where a person couldn't hide in anyone, so they say, you know, I'm ready to die. Fisa bilillah. Ahlan No one's going to live forever. Uh, an example uh, of deen before life. So we put the second, preserving life. If someone puts a gun in our hand and they say, you shoot that person who's totally innocent or I'll shoot you. What do we give preference to? Preserving our life? Or for a religion that we shouldn't take a life unjustly? Even though they're interrelated. But we say, you have to kill me. And there will be a shaheed. So, not directly, the indirect consequence of our, of our decision is the preservation of another's life. But the direct consequence is our observation of the commandment against killing innocent people. So my, my preserving the religious commandment is given a greater priority than my preserving my life. Even though in this example I've preserved a life. So it gets a little murky. But preserving religion is the number one, because why would we give priority to religion over life? Anyone? Or why is Allah Ta'ala giving priority to religion over life? It's going to affect the community. Okay, it's going to affect the community, but more directly. It governs your life. Yeah, it's like a... Because without religion, More people are affected by we don't have a life worth living. What will we put on this earth? We are put here, we live to worship Allah. And if we don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because we've been programmed to worship, we're going to worship something else. And the difference between the two when we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly, 
on the basis of knowledge and on the basis of prophetic guidance, we're elevated. And this leads to our happiness, it leads to sa'adah. Ultimately, a sa'adatul abadiyah, eternal happiness. When we, uh, when we worship something other than Allah, we're debased and it becomes harmful. Right, if someone worships money, what's going to happen? If they worship money, they'll do anything to get it. And doing anything to get it, they debase themselves. If someone worships money and the only way they can get it is to selling, sell drugs to people and destroy people's lives and families, or sell alcohol to people, destroy people's lives and families, or even sell their bodies <clears throat> to get money. What happens to that person? They're debasing themselves. They're debasing themselves. If a, if a person worth, worships clothing, you know, I have to have the latest article, the latest fad. I saw on the, uh, the, uh, the Yahoo homepage, they had sneakers on the computer, the new Air Jordans. Anyone see the new Air Jordans? You like, you zip them up. And, and so it says it's, it's an athletic footwear and a fashion statement. So someone who worships, and it's the Air Jordan number 28. I guess it's 28 years since Michael Jordan started, the Air Jordan. Uh, if someone worships that, what are they going to do? If, if they don't have any, they don't have money, they'll go steal some. They debase themselves. Then they get caught, they're thrown in jail, they're debased. Or they'll rob somebody. You know, Give me your sneakers. It happens, seriously. <laughs> you read periodic in the paper, a person gets robbed for their sneakers. You know, you hear about it. You keep your ear to the ground, you hear people rob for their sneakers, their jackets, their throwback jersey. And it debases, it debases that person. When a person commits a crime, they're not just harming the victim, they themselves are victims, and they themselves are debased. And then it's debasing them because a human being is an intelligent, is, is, is distinguished by our intellect. A person who is chasing a fad has no intellect. They only respond emotionally to things. And they debase themselves. They, they buy something, they throw it out, five years later it's back in style. If they had intellect, they would have kept the one they had. Just put it in the closet, wait for it to come around again. It's debasing. Allahum Mustan, preserving intellect. So, <clears throat> to, to demonstrate just the, how this works in terms of being a philosophy of religion, Prayer, preserving life is the number one priority, so shirk and kufr have been forbidden. Uh, preserving in religion, rather. So kufr is a threat to religion, so it's forbidden. So there's a prohibition, but there's a, a philosophy or a logic to it. Shirk, polytheism, is forbidden. So it, why? Because it undermines religion. And it also undermines our, our ability to live a, a life of fulfilling life. Because if we have, uh, when one of the consequences of shiv is divided loyalties. And divided loyalties lead to internal conflicts. And so by focusing one's devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one resolves the potential for internal tension and conflict. And we could examine that at, at different levels. Pre, uh, preserving life, therefore murder is forbidden. Abortion is forbidden in Islam. So these things are forbidden to preserve life. Preserving the intellect, so to preserve the intellect, alcohol, drugs, all of those things that undermine the intellect are forbidden. You say, okay, then our educational system should be forbidden also. Because <laughs> it's a threat to our intellect. That's, you can make an argument. 
but it emphasizes how important it is for us as Muslims to actively be involved in cultivating our intellect and the intellect of our children and those uh, under our responsibility. Because the religion has been instituted amongst other things to preserve intellect. And so alcohol, drugs, all those things that erode and destroy the intellect, those things are, are, are forbidden. Acting in a state of anger or, or uh, working to remove anger, this is a function of the preservation of our intellect. Because if we perpetuate our anger, we perpetuate the loss of our intellect. So the Qadi can't rule in a state of anger. Why? Because in that state, he or she wouldn't be ruling on the basis of their intellect. So there's a, there's a, a, a principle that's translated into law. So that's the relationship between these universals and the system of Sharia. Preserving the family. So to preserve the family, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, all these things are forbidden because they're threats to the family as we know it. So, as, as we know it, someone might say, well, they really find the family to accommodate uh, certain societal trends. But as Muslims, one of the things that we try to do is to get society to conform to a higher standard as opposed to bringing religion down to our standard. Because religion is lofty and we can be debased. Then we debase them to the lowest of the low. So if we bring the religion down to our standard, what's going to happen? In, in two generations, we're not going to have any religion. Because I'll do away with this ruling I don't like, and you will do away with that one you don't like, and she'll do away with that one that she doesn't like, and then before you know it, the whole thing is gone. So what we're trying to do is elevate ourselves. That's the goal of real religion, is to elevate the human being. Uh, <clears throat> When we talk about the legal maxims, probably next week, uh, those maxims aren't there to become the basis for, uh, or this system, of doing away with fundamental rulings in the religion. They're a basis for us to begin to understand the relationship between principles and rulings but not the basis uh, to avoid every hardship because dealing with hardship is an integral part of religion. Like when you say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you're saying, I'm prepared to deal with some hardship. And if, if, if one doesn't deal with hardship, or one looks for every escape, every a fatwa to justify getting away with this, and a fatwa to justify with getting away with that. Where's the struggle? Allah Ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ So struggle in the way of Allah as shall rightfully be the case. In other words, give everything you have because we'll never fulfill the right. حَقَّ جِهَادِ If Allah Ta'ala just mentioned, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ Then we can say it's, it's subjective. In other words, we could define the struggle based on our circumstances. But Allah Ta'ala says, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ Now it becomes objective. Like, in other words, everybody give everything you have to your utmost. Why? Because حَقَّ جِهَادِ As you should rightfully struggle based on the haqq that Allah Ta'ala has over us. Who could ever fulfill that right? When Allah has given us life, He's given us limb, He's given us health, He's given us wealth, He's given us shelter, He's given us well-being, He's given us clean water, He's given us eyesight, the miracle of the eye. You know, this camera, you have to change the memory chip. You don't have to like put something in your brain like twice a day. 
So, oh, chip's full. <laughs> Some people's chip is full. They have to go cut out. <laughs> but we can we can take in, take in, take in. Never need to change the memory chip. The 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 film and the old cameras, right? You have to change the film. The digital camera, you have to change the chip. Your eye can film for 70 years and you never change the film. 80 years, 90 years, some people are blessed, they have good eyesight, 100 years old, they can still see everything. They never change the film. How much do we all love for that? Then it gives a smell. And smell what? Most, most harmful things have bad odor, most. And we know it's not right. Ugh. So if this were like rotten and spoiled, like, oh man, I didn't need that. Why did they give me this? It's trying to kill me. <laughs> but the smell tells us, and so we pull back, right? So what if we didn't have the smell? Yeah, oh, it looks nice. Go, oh. Well, we have the smell, we have the taste. You taste a little taste, right? The milk went bad. You put it in your mouth, spit it out right away. Why? Because of the taste. How much do we all offer that? How much harm are we able to ward off from ourselves? So, jahidu fillahi haqqa jihadi. And so it's a struggle. Then what does he say? Hu ajtabaqum. He's chosen you. We've been chosen for this struggle because this is the process of what humanizes us. This is what makes us human. And you, you, you see the humanity, are many of you from other countries, periodically you go home, right? And you see that person who's had a hard life. But that hard life, that they've been patient, They've never complained. They can still smile. And you see what? You see so much humanity in that person. You, you're, all, you're all struck, right? The little kid in the, in, the, in the marketplace holding down the stall. It's like 10 years old. You know how much you need. Put the weight in, weigh it up for you. Take the money. Give you, you like, subhanAllah. When I was 10, I was still dealing with Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. And this, this young man, this young lady is holding down a business. And so you see their humanity that came what? Came as a result of their struggle. So it's a struggle, but it's an honor. So Allah says, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ الْجِهَادِ Who اجتباكم? He's chosen you. So we've been chosen for this. Why? Because we've been chosen for this great honor. Five minutes. We've been chosen. And when we accept that, so I accept that I've been chosen. I accept that it's an honor to be able to engage in this struggle for a higher purpose. Then it becomes easy. And so what does Allah say? وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ الْجِهَادِ and he's made no difficulty for you in your religion. It's all in how we see it. If we say, Alhamdulillah, it's a struggle, but it's an honor. Then it's not a struggle anymore. If we don't see it as an honor, but as a burden, ah, oh, I have to do this, and why do I have to do that? This is a drag. I gotta get up in the summertime, four in the morning, pray. Why can't it just be winter all the time? Get up at seven, make wudu real fast, and pray, go to work. I gotta get up four in the morning, I can't go back to sleep. But the person, alhamdulillah, what an honor to be a believer. MashaAllah, you get up two in the morning if you had to. Bismillah. So, He's made no difficulty for you and your religion. 
and then preserving private property. So one of the foundations of the Sharia is the preservation of private property. So again, why is this part of the topic? Ethical foundation. So we mentioned, so to preserve uh, private property, theft, usury, monopoly, hoarding, inside trading, all these things are forbidden in Islam. They all existed in the time of the Prophet wasallam. He forbade them, or they were forbidden by, the, by Allah Ta'ala directly in the Qur'an, or through his Prophet wasallam. So, to preserve private property. But in Islam, the preservation of private property is not an absolute value. It's not an absolute value. So, and just as preserving the intellect isn't an absolute value. So, in other words, we'll never do anything to threaten our intellect. The only absolute value is the preservation of religion. So, if, if I have to drink wine, which is going to alter and affect my intellect to preserve my life, then I can drink the wine. If I have to eat pork, I'm starving. There's nothing to eat except pork. I can eat pork. Just enough to preserve my life. So the intellect is, is undermined by the wine, but life is preserved. Then I can do that. So preserving the intellect is not an absolute value. Preserving the life is not an absolute value. Preserving the family, in some instances, is not an absolute value. Preserving private property is not an absolute value, meaning that there are things that have a higher priority than the preservation of, of property. <coughs> so to preserve property doesn't come at the, the cost of stealing from, from others, or, or rather at the cost of not sharing with others. And so Allah Ta'ala makes that clear. And their wealth is a well-defined right for those who ask and those who are pre prevented by their shyness or other factors from asking. They have a right. The, the sadaqah here meaning zakat is for the poor and the needy. So my preserving my wealth is an absolute. Sometimes I have to give it away. So these are the, the uh, five universals. And so they're the foundation of our legal philosophy. So the foundation of how we think about the principles and the wisdom that underlies the law. And all of these things are built on, as we mentioned. Uh, in, in one way or another. So, the religion, there's a, a fundamental level, and then there's, which is preserving the religion for myself. And then there's, that's obligatory. Then there's the level of doubt. And in most circumstances, that's something voluntary, but it could be obligatory in some, some uh, situations. Preserving my life is, is obligatory, but I also have to extend that to work to preserve the lives of others. And so Allah Ta'ala challenges us in many situations in the Qur'an that why don't you fight for those who are oppressed? So why don't you fight for men, women, and children who are oppressed and then Possibly you lose your life in that path, but you've preserved someone else's life. <coughs> so we build on that. So preserve my life first, but willing to lose my life to preserve someone else's life. So these 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 things they they can all be built on in that sense. We'll stop here very quickly. Are there any questions or comments? Additions, subtractions, deletions. Yes. So, um, 
in preserving life, you gave an example where there is an innocent man involved. If you take the innocent man out of the picture, would you still, should we still say religion over life or? Always religion is, is given preference over life. Even if you are defending yourself. If you're defending yourself and, and, and you die in that path, then you're a martyr. There's a hadith, the Prophet a man came to the Prophet, uh, What if you see a person comes to me, he wants to take my, my wealth, my money. Don't give him your wealth. What do you see if he fights me for? Qatilhu. Then fight him back. Defend your wealth. What do you see if I kill him? What if he kills me? And shaheed. You're a martyr. What if I kill him? He's in hell. So he, he said, defend your wealth. Why? Be, because, <clears throat> and there, there are nuances, there are situations, but in, in preserving religion and or principles, again, we preserve the basic framework that makes us human. Because once our principles go, then we're just animals. Because principles, as we mentioned earlier, they, they emerge from our intellect. Or they emerge from our spiritual nature. And so they emerge from those things that distinguish us from the brute animals. Once we let go of principles and we're no longer working on the basis of our intellect, or our, our spirit, our ruh, are our soul, then we're working on the base of our flesh and we're just like the rest of the animals. And so Allah Ta'ala says about people in that state, هُمْ كَالْأَنْعَامْ بَلْ هُمْ أَضَالْ They're like cattle, nay, they're even more straight. So the, the principles that define our humanity, those things are, are worth dying for. Because if we don't die, uh, as Martin Luther King Jr. famously said, a person who has nothing worth dying for has nothing worth living for. And so these are the things that humanize us. And these are the things that we pass on to our progeny. We pass on more than just physical existence to our children. If we're, if we're really concerned about their well-being, we pass on principles and ideals and values and morals and that gives them a life worth meaning but if we don't pass that on then their life isn't isn't going to be worth living and their whole the human civilization will collapse and this is the the great Egyptian poet Ahmed Shawki in the Malumum al Akhlaqum Ma Baqiyat and whom Zahabat Akhlaqum Zahabu and people are none other than the, the moral system that supports them. When that goes, they will soon follow. And so, what the crisis in this country, people look at the principles that made America great, they're being thrown out the window. And as a result, people say this country is going to, is going to fall in terms of being a, a leader in the true sense of the word. Now, uh, anything else? It's time to pray, even though I didn't hear the other. He made the other? Oh, you should have said something. Uh, Philadelphia, they turn on the tap and they can light the, what's coming out. Because all these chemicals are, are going into the groundwater and then the groundwater is becoming polluted and they can literally ignite it. So we, we have to say no that there are things greater than profit, greater than our ego, greater than our carnal lust. So at, at the end of the day, a lot of our non-traditional, what they're called, uh, sexual mores, are, are rooted in our carnal lust. 
and uh, won't elaborate on that. Protecting wealth within an Islamic framework must be encouraged. So here again, as, as you mentioned in the case of the, the housing policies, uh, people's wealth being literally stolen from them in many instances. Uh, the the uh, check cashing places and quick loan places with 200, 300% interest. People going into debt for the rest of their life over a $200 loan. You have a $200 loan and it's 200% interest and then you miss two or three payments and the interest is compounded. Before you know it, you're going to owe $2,000. And a person working at McDonald's whose car broke and unfortunately the baby got sick at the same time. So, and McDonald's doesn't give you any medical plan because you're working there 20 hours a week. So the person has to choose between fixing the car or buying medicine. They buy medicine, they have to borrow $200 to fix the car, to buy new tires. And so they go to one of these places and now they're in debt for the rest of their life after they miss a few payments. Nam, yes. Just they're, they're, uh, the house is owned by a third party, so they're buying the house from the third party as opposed to... So interest is in kind. <clears throat> so money for money, wheat for wheat, <clears throat> excuse me, gold for gold, silver for silver, salt for salt. So if you're paying money for house and not money for money per se, even though the arrangements to pay that back are structured in a way that you're paying more than you actually took out. So if I buy a house today at $100,000, I take out a loan from them and they say within 30 years pay us back $200,000, fair to say, isn't that $100,000? Well, essentially what you're saying is you're buying a house for $200,000. But you're you're but essentially you're saying you're paying more, so you can get around paying the interest. I just I don't I don't see the difference because it's a contract. In my sense, the bank is saying give me six percent a year, and you you know six hundred dollars a year. Right. Multiply that by thirty, it comes out to say a hundred thousand dollars. Right. For example, on the other end, it's saying okay, the house is ours. You buy it for two hundred thousand. Right. And such period of time. Right. But In the, so and just no, I think. Well, you you you're trying to. No, no, you're not fooling so yourself. No. Okay. But at at the end of the day, right. you're you're. If you're, if you're saying, If you say, <clears throat> I'm going to take my money, enter into a transaction where I'm going to buy money for $100,000, and then I'm going to pay $200,000, then that's a user's transaction. 
if you're saying at the at the end of the day though, I'm paying two hundred thousand. All right. And if you say I'm going to take my money and I'm going to to buy this house for two hundred thousand dollars. Even though its market value right now is a hundred thousand dollars, so you're saying that at the end of the day, no matter how you slice it, I'm going to pay two hundred thousand dollars. So if I get paid two hundred thousand dollars and avoid interest, then I'll do it. That's all you're saying. You're not fooling yourself. You're saying that I will I will pay more than what I would, than the market value to avoid falling into sin. So that's not fooling yourself. That's saying I'm willing to sacrifice to avoid something that's sinful. Well, in the same thing, the car dealers say no interest for the next 10 months, uh, whatever, 10 years. So they, I mean, you can see this thing coming every Well, that's, day. no, 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 that's totally different. No, if, 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 if you raise the car if, prices. If the car if the car is zero percent financed, uh, that's what you're talking about. No, actually, well, actually, actually the dealers makes all kinds of fine deals. You pay well, no, I'll upfront twenty thousand dollars divided by five years, no interest. But and the other the other guy can plug in this thing with eighteen thousand well, dollars. But this is already taking two thousand dollars. In in the man amalu bin niya, what tera what tijara bin ta bin tarabi. Business transactions are based on the buyer being pleased. If someone's pleased with buying a car, if they say that this car that you're going to buy, a 1996, get out and push. So if, if they say, listen, all right, you don't want to pay interest, Mr. Muslim. So I tell you what, the interest will make this car $30,000. So instead of charging you interest, I'll just let you make payments. When you finish making those payments, it's $30,000. And you say, okay, good, I'll do it. That's tijara, that's a lawful business transaction. And you say, why would you do it? Because I don't want to take a loan that I'm going to pay interest on. So I'll just pay you straight up, even though the payments are going to be inflated. That's a business transaction based on pleasure because I'll willingly accept that hardship to avoid what I consider to be sinful. That's the essence of religion. Why don't you eat pork? It might taste good, but some say, I'll bypass it to avoid sin. Why do you buy halal meat? It costs more money than the normal meat. That's the excuse some people use not to eat it, right? They say, why should I pay more money for halal meat? Because I don't want to eat carrion. That's why. So hardship is is the essence of, uh, is a part of what it means to be uh, a religious person like sabr there's there's three types of sabr sabr ala ta patience and dealing with the hardship that comes in avoid and, and worshiping allah so some people in the summertime they don't want to get up for fajr but they say you no know, if that's what it takes to worship Allah, just get up four in the morning to pray. And next year to fast. Or next Ramadan. So some people just sleep. They say, no, oh, it's too much. Allah understands. No, seriously. So they get up at their normal time, six o'clock. The sun came up at 5.30. And they say, you know, Allah understands. So it's it's... And this system that we're in, it is a, a lot of manipulation that's going on. But this is trying to arrive at a solution that's acceptable. And so that a believer accepts that, that hardship, accepts getting ripped off. So he or she can meet their Lord and say, you know, 
I try to avoid the haram to the best of my ability. Yes? Uh, one more question. Um, I have a lot of friends who are in the line of uh, lending money. I know lending money to, in our, in Islam, obviously, is haram interest, right? Yeah. To, they'll give you money, and in return, you, you get an interest back for the money. Right. Right. On a two hundred dollar, then you're in debt for a long time, and it's a struggle for a family to pay that. Right. Back. And these guys are doing the same thing. Right. There's is sinful it, activity. Is it, is it a difference now in, in in Islam in the sense that, for example, if I was to lend money to somebody at twelve percent, and that person is using my money to make money at forty, fifty percent return on it, <laughs> is that sinful? I'm not putting money back. Not me It, it's sinful in that they've entered and they got to pay you back the 12%. So, but they, they use that money. Like right. They're profiting. 50%. They're, pro they're they profiting. The 12 that they have to pay you to right. The money and they profit 38%, for example. Right. So it's it's forbidden. They're both wrong. Okay. So, it doesn't matter who you're doing it or what return. It doesn't doing, matter. If it's 1%. Regardless, it's bad. Because there's a lot of people that tell me, oh, no, you're doing it for a, for a business, for example. You're giving it to a businessman who, in turn, makes money off it. You're not hurting a family. You're not hurting an individual. That's what I'm saying. You, that, that so that's the second one. We said there's patience and obeying Allah. Sabru ala ta. So you patiently endure the hardship of getting up four in the morning in the summertime. What was and and not eating until nine o'clock at night. So you endure that hardship because that's what it takes to obey Allah. Was sabru al an al maasi, and being patient and dealing with the hardship that comes in avoiding forbidden things. So this guy says, you know what, I'm making money hand over fist, but it's haram, so I'm not going to do it. And so, as a result. I can't get the house I want, I can't get the car I need, but I'll just deal with it. I have one question. But he didn't finish. <laughs> okay. This is just a question that I always had for myself to somebody answer. I've asked certain people and they always tell me something different. But ultimately it comes down to back to the Quran. If it says in there it's how long then it's how long. It doesn't matter how you justify it. Exactly, you can't justify how long. Because you entered into a forbidden transaction to get the money in the first place. You okay. borrowed at 12%. That's forbidden. So everything after that collapses because it's built on a false foundation. But if um, you were to own a property and rent it to somebody... And then, and then what he's doing, if he's making 30 40%, he's shortchanging someone somehow. They're, and they're both they're both in 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 danger. Allahu a'lam, Allah knows best. They're both in danger because they're both doing something forbidden. I I, I can't uh, enter into a forbidden transaction, then do something that's forbidden. But because it's helping my family, I can justify it. Or do something forbidden and then do something lawful. Because the foundation is, is forbidden. So everything else collapses after that. Oh, I know. Yes. Right. So then it's a, it's a different scenario, right? Then it's not an interest. You know, like if, if these two guys who are making a transaction, so they 
you know, right now he's lending money and he's asking for 12% interest. Yeah, so if he g gives that and- I right, understand, I'll it's the same thing, it's just the Sharia law. Uh, yeah, yeah, so just, just manipulate it differently to say, hey, yeah. listen, I'm not gonna charge you 12, 12%, but I'm gonna give you 100,000, but give me back in five months 112,000. But that's totally different. No, because that's, this, this is money, this is what I'm saying, that's, that's, that's money for money. This is money for house. Interest is only in light commodities. There's no possibility for interest here. If you're, you, if you're using that to pay off this house, if you're using this to pay off this money, even at 1% increase, that's where the interest comes in because it's like commodities. So this is what I'm saying, to avoid this situation, you're entering into this situation. It could be like for like. Exactly. It could be something else, I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. So it says that 12,000 in my pocket, give it to me, and it's worth my mortgage 12,000. All right, all right, I'll, I'll, let's. But who's to say that house is going to be worth 200000 in such a period of time? So you're assuming. Hey guys, we got five minutes before our shot. Five minutes before our shot. Five minutes before our shot. All right. All right, listen, uh, we have to wrap. No, no, no need to apologize. No, no. It's, it's a good issue. We have a separate discussion on this issue. <laughs> but in, in the interest of time, we have five great legal maxims and we have five minutes. Then we have uh, three weeks of, of not being here. So these legal maxims are the foundation of our legal thinking. So each set of five was foundational in a particular area. So these are, the affairs are judged by the ultimate objectives, al maqasidiha which is similar to the hadith in the mal'amalu bin niyat. Harm is to be removed, that darar yuzal. So this is why we say, after we know the harm, detriment of cigarette smoking, that is haram, because we know it causes cancer, which the first early scholars didn't know. Not early, but those who gave fatawa saying it's makru. They didn't know it causes lung cancer or heart disease, um, throat cancer, etc. Hardship, hardship justifies these, a mashaqa tajlib at taysir. So, uh, hardship, and this goes back to the eating pork to war, or drinking alcohol to ward off hunger or thirst. So, the hardship of starvation or dying of thirst justifies easing rulings. Just to deal with the hardship, not as an ongoing permanent principle, which is very important. Uh, certainty is not removed by doubt. So, al yaqeen la yazulu bishak. So, if you know you made wudu and you're not sure if you lost it, you still have wudu. Why? Because you're certain about making it. And you don't know if you broke it, so you still have it. Also, at a higher level, the principle that we know here, a uh, person is innocent until proven guilty. We're, we're sure that of their innocence. We, we don't know if they did the crime or not. So until we have certainty about their committing the crime, doubt cannot remove certainty. Certainty is not removed by doubt. And custom has legal consideration. So custom and convention that doesn't violate uh, any uh, shari uh, conventions has, is legally uh, considered. So for example, if someone says, can I wear 
a coat like this, which is a Western coat, because people here wear these coats. So no one can say, no, that's a Kafir coat. Why? Because it's customary dress. It doesn't violate any Shari convention, not so tight or it's not transparent. It's not made out of pig leather. So the custom is valid. So a Muslim can follow that custom because it's not violating uh, or contradicting with any principle or ruling in Sharia. So, and then there's more to say about that, but just in the interest of finishing. Then we have the five great messengers, and these are Ulul Azm Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, alayhi salam, Muhammad, salawatullah, salamu alayhim, ajma'in. So, these five great messengers. They're at the, the top, the pinnacle of the messengers that Allah Ta'ala sent to the world. And we emphasize uh, the messengers because they're the foundation of our guidance. They are the ones who brought us this thinking about the rulings that Allah uh, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sent to guide humanity. And so their heritage is what we're trying to preserve. Our ulama wa rafatul anbiya. The scholars are the heirs of the prophets. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. You're the best of communities raised up uh, for the service of humanity. But raised up under who? Under Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that's the conclusion of that. Then we had the five great challenges to sharia. But other than rushing through, we just do it when we come back, inshallah. So those challenges being, we'll just list them. The secular discourse, pluralism, Western ideas of gender equality, the nation state, and global finance. <laughs> then we can go into that subject, inshallah. So it's time for Isha. So as opposed to rushing just to finish, to say we finished, inshallah, we'll, we'll save this. For that time. In fact, we'll go back to the uh, messengers and even we'll go back to here. Because there's more to be said here, but there's no more time to say it. So, as opposed to just rushing through, we'll come back to here in three weeks, inshallah ta'ala. Yes. <laughs> وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته <تصفيق> الحمد لله So this is where we left off last week We discussed these five great universals And we mentioned that they're the foundation of our legal philosophy. In other words, how do we think or understand the wisdom that uh, supports the system of rulings that the Sharia involves? So, those rulings don't exist in isolation. So, we mentioned uh, before that. Some people try to extract the rulings, look at them in isolation, divorce them from a larger system, and by so doing, distort the very nature of the Sharia. So what we want to do is to provide the context that allows us to look at various rulings in a uh, philosophical, a larger intellectual, a larger ethical context. And the ethical context being the primary focus of this presentation. So last week we mentioned that these five great universals are the preservation of life, the, preserva the preservation of religion, the preservation of life, the preservation of intellect, preservation of the family, preservation of private property, and that these are arranged, they are prioritized. So religion is first, then life, then intellect, then family, and then private property or ideas. And this uh, system 
provides us with a foundation to begin to involve ourselves in uh, a more sophisticated form of legal thinking. So by way of example, we mentioned if your life is in danger, then you can drink alcohol if you're going to die of thirst and there's nothing else to drink. There's no water, there's no juice, there's nothing lawful to drink. One can drink alcohol. Why? Because alcohol is a threat to the intellect and life has a higher priority. So if alcohol is the only thing we have to preserve our life, then we drink it to the extent necessary to preserve our life and until we find something lawful to drink. So why? Because preserving life has a higher order than preserving intellect. We mentioned preserving religion has a higher order than preserving life. And that's why we have the concept of shahada, of martyrdom, which is another word that's been uh, dirtied up by contemporary developments. You say martyrdom and people think of some guy going into the middle of a market and blowing himself up. They say, al-amaliyatul istishhadiya. So he's a martyr. He's not a martyr, he's a murderer. He's also a person who committed suicide, which is a major sin. So true martyrdom is being killed for the defense of faith. And so faith has a higher priority for life. So if we have to give our life up for the faith, we gladly do it because the faith has a higher priority. And of course, there are nuances in terms of is a person allowed to dissimulate, to preserve their life? Uh, that is a permissible thing. But as a general rule, as you mentioned in the example last week that we gave in terms of the person being robbed who gives up his or her life, they're defending a higher principle that is uh, demonstrating there are some things worth dying for. And we mentioned in that context the saying of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a person who has nothing worth dying for, has nothing worth living for. So these are things that humanize us. To just give a, a, another example that would be slightly more controversial, on the surface is, I would argue, that in light of the drug wars in Mexico, most of which are focused around who controls the marijuana trade, that it would be preferable to legalize marijuana here. And, the, and some Muslims say, what? When you say legalize, it doesn't make it halal. It just means that people who are possessing marijuana or in the privacy of their homes using it or or they can buy it in the store like alcohol so if we say oh you can't do that then why can people sell alcohol and we're not objecting the fact that you can in this non-muslim country sell alcohol doesn't make it halal and doesn't make it permissible for muslims to use but even in a Muslim majority country that's governed by Sharia, Christians who uh, aren't, uh, whose shar allows them to drink wine, they can make wine in their homes, they can drink it, they can't sell it publicly or publicly display it, but in the privacy of their homes they can consume it. There's no uh, justification for someone kicking their door down and taking them all to jail. And that's a well-known fact. They can raise pigs. We can't eat pork. Muslims, they can eat pork. They can raise pigs in their backyard. And they can have their ham for turkey, uh, for Christmas rather. I don't know how ham got associated with Christmas. I don't know. You have to ask a Christian. But in a Muslim country, they can do that. So the fact that it's lawful for them doesn't make it lawful for us. But in the case of, one second, the marijuana, 60,000 people have been murdered in Mexico in the last six years behind these drug wars in the most brutal ways. Most of them are innocent people. And so 
preserving life in this case, which is threatened by these wars, by making this legal when it's a threat to the intellect and would eliminate the foundation of that violence would be preferable to saying this is outlawed and then you have these thousands of people being murdered as a result and a lot of other illicit activities going on. So this would provide a framework. We could argue preserving the intellect and the marijuana is a threat to the intellect is of lesser priority than preserving life. And the illegalization of marijuana is leading to massive loss of life. Now saying that, I reiterate, that doesn't make it halal. That just in, in the overall legal structure of the society will make it available for those people who feel they're allowed to consume it, which aren't, isn't Muslims. And then there are other studies that argue that uh, legalizing drugs such as heroin in Switzerland doesn't increase the consumption of it. So someone might counter argue you're going to make more drug addicts, but research hasn't shown that to be true. But that's just an example of how this provides us a framework to be, begin thinking in ethical terms and, and ethics again, what's right or wrong? So is it right to have all these people dying because legally this particular product is, is rendered illegal? So what's more right? What's more wrong? And so we began to get into an area of, of jurisprudence, which the fuqaha called the fiqh tawazun, or the fiqh, the jurisprudence of weighing and measuring. An example of that, and then we'll come to your question, is uh, we mentioned this before, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, was walking with a group of his students in Damascus <coughs> where he taught and died and is buried in fact. And uh, some of the Tartar soldiers who had invaded that region during the Mongol invasions, they were uh, drunk in the street and they were laughing and talking loud and behaving in a riotous fashion. So the students who of Ibn Taymiyyah said we should stop them from drinking. The alcohol is the mother of all of the major sins. In other words, the, the thing that gives birth to the major sins and they're defiling our sacred city. And Ibn Taymiyyah said, leave them. Let them get drunk. He said when they're drunk, they act like fools. When they're sober, they rape and pillage. So which is worse? So is weighing out harms and benefits. And this is an aspect of our divine law. And this is one of the schemes that the fuqaha use to uh, make those assessments. Yes, Fenton, what were you going to say? So back, back when, when you were talking before, I was just going to say that Obviously, that would that would just normalize it and make the prices. So everything would be the, the price would theoretically go drop down, so there wouldn't be so, so much to be fighting for. Those drugs. Would well, I mean, if you legalize it, you don't have to go to the back alley and you just go to the local drugstore. Price should drop way down, so right, so there wouldn't be so much to fight for. So well, the money. the market could be regulated. Well, there wouldn't be money to fight for anyway, un unless you're the mafia running the government. <laughs> because the government would control the, and regulate the trade. So you take, it's like prohibition. Yeah. You have prohibition, you had Al Capone, and you had all these gangs that were fighting to control the illegal trade. Once they legalized alcohol again, ended prohibition, then the government become the became the regulatory agency and all those uh, gangs were put out of business. Why would someone meet someone in the woods to get a, at a still that's being run by the mafia to buy a, a jug of illegal alcohol when you can go to your local supermarket? So that takes the criminal element out of it altogether. That's the point. And it drops the price. That's debatable. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
تفضل Right, or or some people say irut, so like that honor. Would, that would relate to the housing bubble. Is that correct? How so? Can you explain that one. That we are trying to protect the rights of people and their properties, and not allow these sorts of um, all sorts of mo- uh, mortgage deals that were taking place to inflate the price. Right, artificially. Artificially. You could you could argue that. You could you could argue that, in terms of those being, which shor'an they would be unlawful contracts. Because someone, is lying. Either the the buyer is lying about his or her income, the uh, bank is lying about, uh, the the terms, of the mortgage or disguising. The real terms, or engaging in fallacious uh, advertisement to weasel homeowners, such as elderly people, out of their home by convincing them to refinance, and then they give them a, a variable rate mortgage that they looks handsome initially, but then it goes up two thirds in 18 months, and they can't pay it anymore. And so they f- have to foreclose. They paid the house off. They owned it outright. They refinanced it to get money out of the bank they were sitting on. And then in two years, they don't have a house anymore. So those, you could say, to preserve their property, definitely those sort of regulations would be called for in an order that's controlled by Sharia, which would be attractive to a lot of people. Yes, Pervez. Uh, where does preserving one's honor or family's honor? Usually it's a sixth, or it's uh, in the place of the mad, the wealth. So some, some scholars present it as a number six, or some leave it at five and they substitute the honor for the wealth. Yes. Couldn't honor, honor be a cup of religion? Ani, in what sense? Religious religion is 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 honor, but maintaining religion is maintaining honor. For you, but does that prevent someone from saying, "Yeah, you're such an idiot," or spreading rumors about you, slandering you, <coughs> on on non-religious grounds? So your your religion is coupled with your honor in the sense that if you are are adhering to the teachings of religion, you close the door for people to, to rightfully attack your honor. And so the in al halal abayin, when al haram abayin, wa bain huma umurun mushtabiha, la yarithu hunna, la yalamu hunna kathirun min nas, famanit taka shubuhat, fakadis tabra ali dini wa irde. So the lawful is clear, the unlawful is clear. Uh, and between them are doubtful matters. Most people don't know their rulings. Whoever avoids the doubtful matter escapes with their religion and their honor intact. So we mentioned many times the example, if we're not sure if this is alcohol or, or, or fruit juice. So we smell it and, oh, it smells like fruit juice that's getting a little old starting to ferment. If we leave it, no one can say you, you violated religion by drinking alcohol. No one can say, no, what, what kind of person, Muslim are you? Like you, you drink alcohol, like the average Muslim doesn't do that. You're supposed to be some student of knowledge. What kind of person are you? So now they can attack. But if you drink it, then someone says, then you just drink. Uh, Livermore's finest wine. It's, uh, I thought it was fruit juice. You, you thought, you, didn't you smell it? I saw you smelling it. It smells like alcohol. You know, what kind of person are you? Now your honor and your, and your religion are exposed to, to being lessened. 
So in that sense, they're linked. But in the sense of preserving them, uh, there, there are bases and foundations for people of, of, of assaulting, assailing people's honor for non-religious purposes. So in that sense, they're not linked. Wallahu alam wal mustan. So what, what this scheme allows us to do is to reassess certain issues that prevail here in the West. So for example, reassessing human rights. So as a Muslim, it's our religion that is at the core of our humanity. So if we've been created to worship and preserving the religion is the number one priority in our lives, then an aspect of human rights that should be protected are the rights to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for a person to worship. And uh, this has to be the number one priority. And there, there can be no meaningful human rights scheme without the preservation of religion. And you see this playing out in a sense in Egypt right now where the secularists are saying uh, the Constitution can't be based on religion. And the Muslims are saying it has to be based on religion. And, but the Muslims have to have the wisdom to present to the people that because it's based on religion, it doesn't violate fundamental rights for minorities especially. So Sharia would protect the rights of Coptic Christians to freely worship any uh, there, to worship in the way they choose, as it has for 1,400 years since Islam first went to, to, into Egypt. That's why there's so many Christians left there in the first place. The Muslims could have wiped out the Christians, forcibly converted everyone generations ago, and the people there now would never even realize that there was a Christian presence. But that's not permissive, permitted in Sharia. <clears throat> but worship is the number one priority. Therefore, human rights have to be an integral part, or, or rather, the right to religion and acknowledging our Creator has to be at the, the top of any human rights regime. Usually now it's at the bottom or not mentioned at all. Uh, the second is environmental wholesomeness must be encouraged as a fundamental human right. Why is that? Sisters. Sisters are quiet. Brothers are asking all the questions. Why should environmental wholesomeness be encouraged? Preserving the environment as a fundamental human right. Based on what we just said. You're not a sister. Yeah, your beard's too big. <laughs> yes. Uh, how so? Right. If we can't breathe the air, if we can't drink the water, if uh, all of our, there's no more organic food left, seeds left, and we don't know the long-term health consequences of genetically modified seeds. He said, you're just a sore loser, because Prop 37 went down. After $47 million pumped in by Monsanto and Dow Chemical. But we'll get them next time. But there, there's no basis for life. We, we'll, we'll, there's no way we can live. And so if the Sharia argues that one of its fundamental underlying principles is the preservation of life, then we have to consciously work to preserve the environment which supports life. Whereas now, capitalist system, the bottom line is supported. And so all of these companies who are spending the money to work against any meaningful environmental protection they're doing so because they see it as a threat to their profits, which is very short-sighted. So this, if we have to put a filter on our smokestack, it's going to cost us X millions 
of dollars that's coming out of our profit. So we'd rather spend a few million lobbying against such regulations and protections than many millions to put these filters on, on our smokestacks. And so the, the environment doesn't figure into the calculation at all. But as Muslims, we have to say it, it has to figure into the calculation because if we destroy our natural home, then our life is threatened and Sharia is, is, is established to preserve life. So developing true intelligence must be encouraged. So what are the implications of that? Developing true intelligence and protecting and preserving intelligence. This comes from the third one, preserving the intellect. What are the implications of that? Okay, so we have to encourage uh, education. education as a human right, not as a privilege for the wealthy, and not as, uh, uh, as something that is geared towards feeding the proper skills into the industrial and corporate sector but as a fundamental human right, available to all, equally, because everyone is equally human. So our current policies moving towards privatized schools, moving towards charter schools, <clears throat> which, which is inherently unequal, because wealthier neighborhoods will have more advanced charter schools, because they have a higher income uh, bracket, they have a higher spending per capita on children. Some of the disparities, if you look at the disparity between what's spent on the education of a child in Oakland and what's spent here in Pleasanton, you see a huge discrepancy. And you're talking about, what, 20 mile difference. And many of the people in Pleasanton are making their money in Oakland. If you follow the, if you follow the rush hour, like I just did, and some of you, I'm sure did. So, we have to say no. This is a fundamental human right that every child has. Yes. Well, we're just generalizing here by, in terms of intelligence. The aql is, uh, intelligence generally is associated with the reasoning process or faculty in a human being, whereas aql is reason coupled with the ability to know one's creator. And so it's associated more with the heart than with the, with the brain or the mind per se. But I'm generalizing and conflating between the two, inshallah. A preserving marriage between a man and a woman as a fundamental human right. So this world is saying human rights demands same-sex marriage. Otherwise, you're denying the homosexual the right that the heterosexual has. Whereas as, as people who believe in revelation and who believe in common sense, we're saying no, marriage is a union between a man and a woman consecrated by God. And one of its purposes is physical procreation. So if you encourage a system where Marriage is divorced from procreation, and it's also divorced from, from scripture. And what has, has been uh, given to us by the prophets, 
then you're, you're setting up a situation of zero population growth. And it doesn't take a large percentage. And so some parts now, here in America, if you take away the immigrant populations, you have zero population growth. In Europe, even with, you have negative population growth. In Europe, with the immigrants, you have negative population growth. And part of that is the erosion of traditional marriage. And so uh, we should be very, very uh, careful not to buy into this current scheme which is based on a concept of human rights that, number one, doesn't aim at preserving the family, and number two, eliminates uh, God as a source of human rights. So by preserving God, we preserve scripture. By preserving scripture, there are certain, <clears throat> we believe, God-given principles governing marriage, and one it's between a man and a woman. Call us. And secondly, that this is something that's been revealed to us and handed down to us by a series of prophets. And so this is why we say reassessing human rights. So looking at this scheme, so yani hifvun nasal, preserving the family. That has implications in terms of how we interpret something like human rights. So these are, these are fundamental foundational issues that as Muslims we should be very, very cognizant of because we're trying to preserve something in the world. And if we lose it, we enter into the realm of social experimentation. And we don't know where it's going to lead. So they're doing all these things, same-sex marriage, GMO food, uh, uh, dump anything into the environment. Like now, uh, uh, hydraulic fracking, fracturing, fracking. So you pump all these chemicals into the aquifer, into the ground to force out the natural gas. Some people, uh, there's a, a documentary, Gasland, which two years ago would have won best documentary the gas industry lobbied Hollywood and threatened them to cut off all funding if that, that documentary won the best documentary. But it looked at hydraulic fracking. People in some states in Wyoming and in the West, but now they're doing this back east in New York State. <laughs> She just must have a thing with the power so she comes. Oh, you unplugged it? Yeah. No, no, she, no, she she still it. She plugged it. Uh, yeah. Let's go. Okay, uh, this is where we left off. We actually had gone past this, but we rushed it, so we said we'll come back and uh, do a proper consideration. So we're looking at those aspects of Sharia that provide depth, contextualization, and flexibility. And this is what has really, these features of Sharia has allowed Islam to be so attractive to so many people in so many times and places and circumstances. So if it weren't for a certain amount of 
legal flexibility, then that would not have happened. So we mentioned the high fives. We mentioned five pillars, uh, five ethical valuations, the high, the wajib, the mustahab, mubah, makru, haram, five. We mentioned the five pillars, so the shahada, salat, zakat, siyam, hajj. We mentioned the five uh, maqasid, the overarching objectives of the divine law, specifically the preservation of life, of deen, of deen, and life, hayat, and intellect, aql, family, nasal, and private property, wealth, or some mention the fifth as ir, or uh, honor. And so now we're we reached a point of five great legal maxims as the foundation of our legal thinking. So we mentioned one was uh, the foundation of legal philosophy, uh, etc. So here is the foundation of legal thinking. In other words, how, how do the fuqaha, uh, what is the framework that they understand the rulings of the Sharia? within the context of. So, these are five major considerations. There are many, many others, but these are the major ones. <coughs> so the first is very closely parallel to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, إِنَّمَا الْعَذَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Actions are based on the attentions behind them. And so, this is uh, called affairs are judged by the ultimate Objectives and umur bi maqasidiha. So, umur affairs bi maqasidiha are judged based on their ultimate objectives. So, to give an example of that, if if we just looked at the ruling for murder, the qatl, and uh, a child uh, punches an adult. The child weighs 70 pounds. The adult weighs 250 pounds. But the child caught the adult just right. Just at the right angle. Bam! Why are you laughing? You're thinking of, man, I know some adults, I want to. <laughs> so the child he got the adult just right and the adult died. <coughs> well, how should he laugh? We wouldn't say that this child is a murderer because the intention of the child was not to, to kill that person. And that sort of blow in normal circumstances wouldn't result in a fatality. So uh, another example is uh, <coughs> a similar example, uh, a, a person renounces Islam and but they they were clearly threatened their life was threatened and so we knew they renounced Islam to preserve their life which is a legal thing to do not saying everyone would some people just say you know you know I'll die a believer so even if in any case that person so their objective was not to leave the faith the faith was always in their heart. Their objective was to save their life. And so the affair would not, that person would be, not be judged as an apostate. Because why? Their ultimate objective was not to leave the faith. Their objective was to save their life. So those are just some examples of this particular principle. So a faqih who's adjudicating these cases would not, in the first case, pronounce uh, a, a ruling of murder. In the second case, would not pronounce that person as having to re restate their shahada, etc. So reaffirm their Islam, because that person would not be judged as having left Islam, even though it's best to reaffirm the shahada, but not a legal necessity. So why affairs are made just by their ultimate objectives. I, a, a person who, and let's do the opposite of the case of murder. 
a person, so he said, a person killed someone, but their ten intention wasn't to kill them. <coughs> the opposite case, a person was in a situation where they claimed they weren't trying to kill someone, but they used uh, an instrument over and beyond what's necessary to ward off harm from themselves. So to go back to the first scenario, the little child who weighs 70 pounds goes up and clobbers. If a, if a 70 pound child can clobber anyone, like clobbering is... <laughs> so, and the person didn't die. It was what usually happens when a 70 pound child strikes a 250 pound adult. Nothing happened. And so the adult turns around and grabs a, a, a baseball bat and knocks the kid over the head and then the child passes away. And then the, they say to the judge, I was defending myself. That wouldn't be uh, accepted as self-defense because number one, the force necessary to ward off a 70 pound child by a 250 pound man doesn't require a baseball bat or any other weapon. The bare hands are sufficient. Hey, you brat, get over here, go home, get out of here, go home to your mother. If you hit me again, I'm gonna spank you. That usually would do the trick. I'm sorry, sir, I, I don't know what happened. I didn't mean to hit you. Please don't hit me back. I'm sorry, I won't do it again. So even though that person claims self-defense, their objective had to have been to afflict significant, if not fatal, harm to that child. Why? Because normally it doesn't take a baseball bat in the hand of a 250 pound man to ward off a 70 pound child. So the judge in this case would look at the extenuating circumstances and then make a ruling based on those circumstances and not based on the superficial situation of this child was aggressing and therefore this person was defending themselves. No, they were, the force has to be commensurate to the threat. This is the principle in our Sharia. The force has to be commensurate to the threat. Uh, harm is to be removed. A darar yuzad. A darar yuzad. And this is close to the hadith. Uh, there's no harm, no reciprocating harm in the religion. And from that hadith, that's a dalil for this principle, yuzal, harm, harm is to be removed. <clears throat> so on this basis, all of the fatawa that uh, argue for the permissibility of smoking were, vi were nullified. Why? Because those fatawa which were issued before the harm of cigarette smoking were known become invalid once it's known that this is harmful. So originally they thought cigarette smoke offends your neighbors. So that's makru. It dirties your teeth. And that's makru. Oral hygiene was from the sunnah of the Prophet to use the siwak. So, in other words, good oral hygiene. So it dirties your mouth. So it's makru. It offends the angels who are recording. So you're blowing smoke in the faces of the angels that accompany you. So looking at those sort of uh, consequences of cigarette smoking, the early scholars, such as Sheikh Abdul Ghani Nablusi, who wrote a fatwa arguing that it's makru. But in the 20th century, once it became proven by medical, by science, that cigarette smoking causes cancer, causes lung disease, emphysema, it causes uh, cancer of the mouth, of the throat, of the lungs. Secondhand smoke is more deadly to those in your vicinity than the direct smoke you're inhaling. So on that basis, any scholar worth his turban said that <coughs> cigarette smoking is haram. 
based on this principle, darum yuzan, harm is to be removed. So, our religion cannot uh, countenance, cannot facilitate a situation that results in harm to human beings. So, and this is a foundation of our legal thinking. So, this is an example. Something that might, when the harm is not known, be declared to be lawful, or even or disliked, but still permissible, can be declared forbidden. So, harm is to re be removed. And on this basis, we can argue for a, a series of things that Muslims should be advocating for the removal of harm, such as uh, there has to be more research. Well, I won't, since there has to be more research, I won't mention it. Uh, the next principle, hardship justifies easy rulings. Al-mashaqqatu tajlib at taysir So, difficulty, hardship, justifies easing of rulings. Now, tajlib at taysir wa laysa al So, it eases rulings, but it doesn't eliminate rulings. <coughs> An example of that, well-known example, if one is starving, one can eat pork to maintain one's life. So the hardship of starvation eases the ruling of eating pork. The, har the hardship of, of dying of thirst eases the prohibition of drinking alcohol. So the only thing you have is a bottle of wine. If you don't drink it, you'll starve to death. So, uh, but it eases, it doesn't make alcohol lawful, it doesn't make pork lawful. So one consumes just enough in that situation to preserve their life. One conserves just enough, consumes just enough to preserve their life. They don't, oh, yeah, we're starving, oh, oh. Oh, man, I should starve every day. <laughs> and once the hardship is gone, then the ruling reverts back to its original strictness. So, al-mashakkatu tajlib at taysir So again, this is uh, the hardship of taking a, a gusl, which is the original ruling for showering, when it's intensely cold. And so there were the famous incident where a group of the Sahaba, they were on a journey, what happened? And the man woke up in the morning in a state, he needed to take ghusl. And he asked for a dispensation, what happened? And when they got back to Medina, None. And if they didn't know, they should have asked, they've killed him. They've killed him. So the faqih knows that, yes, he's supposed to take ghusl, but the extreme cold we're experiencing and the extreme, the inability to heat the water might result in harm to this person. So that person has a dispensation to make tayammu. So, the hardship justifies the easing of ruling. So, it doesn't eliminate the ruling, but it justifies easing the ruling. The next one, certainty is not removed by doubt. So, al yaqeen la yazulu bishak. So, we talked about this and on a personal level, this principle is the foundation of the idea. By way of example, if you, you're sure you made wudu and you're not sure you lost your wudu. So you still have wudu. Why? Well, you're sure you made it. I got up this morning, like I always do. I staggered to the washroom, almost tripped over something. I could barely open my eyes, and I made wudu. Did I lose it? Then I ate breakfast, and then I went out to take the garbage out, 
You're not sure you still have it. Why? You're sure you made it. You're not sure you lost it. Certainty, al yaqeen al wudu, la yazulu, is not eliminated. Bishak by doubt. I lose it, so you still have it. That's at a personal level. At a societal level, the principle well known here in the West that a person is innocent until proven guilty. <coughs> because we know this person, as far as we know, that they didn't do anything. We're certain about that. Now there's suspicion that they may have committed crime A, B, C, or D. But we're not sure. So until we're sure, the doubt about their committing the crime doesn't remove the certainty about their state of innocence. So the principle here in the West is a person is innocent until proven guilty. And so this is an exact uh, example of al yaqeen la yazul bishak. So we did the person uh, steal the item? I don't know, we have to review the tape, the security tape from the store. We have to ask, question the witnesses. We have to see if there are any witnesses. We have to do fingerprints on the items we restore, recovered from the person's house. So until we establish with evidence that this person is guilty, that person is innocent. Why? We're certain about their innocence. We doubt as to whether they commit the crime. Al-Yaqeen la yazul bishak. And the next one, the fifth, custom has legal consideration. And al-adatu muhakkama. So, yani al-adatu yurithul ahkam. Al-adatu muhakkama. So custom has legal consideration. In other words, any custom that doesn't contradict the direct ruling of the Qur'an or the Sunnah, doesn't contradict something, the ijma of the Ummah, then that, that custom or any established principle of the religion, that custom is legally acceptable. So the urf or al adam al so just wearing Western clothes. If the clothes are not made from pork or pig skin, or the, the, pork, the clothing uh, wasn't stolen, uh, etc., then that, that clothing is lawful and it's loose. It conforms to the general guidelines of Salaam Alaikum. getting started anyway. Some of you were here on time. Fairness. So, that custom is legally acceptable. And this is a, a food. The food doesn't have wine, it doesn't have alcohol rather, it doesn't have lard or pork derivatives directly uh, into, uh, entered into it, then that's lawful to eat. So, you know, spaghetti isn't Muslim food. You have to eat biryani. You can eat spaghetti as long as the meatballs are halal. You can eat spaghetti and meatballs. It's just, it becomes Muslim food, Muslim Italian food. Right? You can eat any roast beef as long as the beef is halal. You can eat macaroni and cheese. You can eat cornbread. Just don't cook it in lard. So custom it has legal consideration. This is one of the reasons that Islam has been so attractive to so many people. So if I ask by way of example, I did this uh, Sunday in San Francisco, but just to reiterate, uh, um, if you look at Islam, consider the fact are there any significant Christian populations in Asia? Like, is there a single Christian town in Asia? Anywhere in Asia? Anyone know of it? A, a town. Philippines. I mean, Philippines is, that's the South Pacific. <laughs> there are none. 
Now, there's a lot of proselytizing, proselytizing, proselytizing in Indonesia. But generally, there are no significant Christian populations in Asia. Are there any significant Christian populations in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh? No significant, maybe what, 1%, 0.5% Christian? There are no significant Christian populations. Are there any significant Christian populations uh, in Africa? Uh, well, Africa is where we have Ethiopia, but let's do this one. Are there any significant Buddhist or Hindu populations in Africa? No. You have some imported by the British in the South Africa, Uganda. Idi Amin took care of Uganda, kicked everyone out. Tanzania, but there's no real significant uh, Buddhist and Hindu populations in Africa. In Europe, are there any significant Hindu Buddhist population in Europe? No, there might be a very small percentage of Hindu <coughs> migrants from India. It's very insignificant. Look, the Americas, are there any significant Buddhist Hindu population? Not really. Recent immigration, but historical. But if you look at Islam, the significant Muslim populations in Europe, Albania, Bosnia, the Iberian Peninsula before the Inquisition, present-day Spain and Portugal, so, uh, Russia still has major Muslim populations, but at one time Russia had probably a Muslim majority. They were largely exterminated by Catherine the Great, Ivan the Terrible, Etc. There's Africa is the first Muslim majority continent, over 50 percent. North Africa, almost all Muslim: Egypt, Libya, Jazair, Tunis, Maghrib, Mauritania, Senegal, Mali, most of Chad, Sudan, particularly North Central Sudan, Darfur. Darfur is all Muslim. Allah bless him. Them and everyone else. There are significant Muslim populations in what is called the Indian subcontinent, as we all know. India has, even though it's not a Muslim majority, has one of the largest Muslim populations on earth. Pakistan, Bangladesh, almost, almost 100% Muslim. Malaysia, Patani area of Thailand, southern Philippines, Mindanao. Indonesia, the most populous Muslim country. So look at the wide variety of cultures. And now Islam is spreading here. If you consider, we have 10,000 people going from Hajj to Hajj from North America every year now. It's a significant delegation. So it's a growing population. Europe, you have we say, are there any Christian cities in India, Pakistan? No, there are no Christian cities. There's some Christian converts, some Christian adherents. You have Muslim cities in the United Kingdom. You have Muslim suburbs in Paris. Hundreds of thousands. Bradford is a Muslim city in the United Kingdom. Nelson is a Muslim city. The United Kingdom. Birmingham is almost a Muslim city. Half of Birmingham, right? And and this just shows the the why even though a lot of that's from immigration, but Bosnia is not immigration. Albania is not immigration. These are Muslim countries in Europe. European Muslim, blonde hair, blue eyed. It shows the tremendous cultural, uh, as culturally assimilative nature of Islam. That custom is incorporated uh, into the local manifestations of Islam. So most of the people here have Western dress. Sisters have various combinations of influences. 
unique influences. And no one would say that anyone's any less Muslim because this unique kind of American flavored Muslim dress. So this is a, a, a reality and it's a reality that we should cherish. We shouldn't allow people to impose this sort of cookie cutter Islam on us. Oh brother, you're not dressed, you need to dress sunnah. What's sunnah brother? Shawar khamis. Oh, like the Hindus wear? They wear it also, right? You need sharwani. You need a nice sharwani. Yeah. Then they, uh, Nehru wear sharwani. That Muslim dress. You need a jalabiya. Jalabiya is Persian. The Prophet wore the Izara and the Ridat, like the people going to Hajjwa. But when they brought him trousers from Yemen, he wore them. They brought him this or that article of clothing, he wore it. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is something we should be very cognizant of. Then finally, the five great messengers, Ulul Azam, Nuh alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these are the five great messengers, they're referred to as Ulul Azam. And the reason we mention them, number one, first of all, to remind ourselves, and you all know this, hence remind, that we are the heirs of their legacy. And so the, the sharia that we have is the heir of what they introduced into the world. In other words, even though the, the specifics of their sharia differed, the underlying ethical foundation was the same. The underlying... Uh, desired result is the same, namely submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are heirs to that tradition, that prophetic tradition. And we should never underestimate the significance of that. The prophetic heritage is being assaulted in the world. It's being ridiculed. It's being belittled. It's being scoffed at. And not just uh, Muslims, Muslims are seen by many in the West as the latest <coughs> and most uh, committed heirs of the prophetic legacy in, in a certain sense. <clears throat> but even amongst Christianity, religious Jews, it's being, it's being undermined, it's being scoffed at, it's being dismissed. And so we have a responsibility to keep that heritage alive. And the key goes back to the methodology or, or one of the primary reasons these prophets succeeded. So in the Quran, Allah Ta'ala reminds us so Allah Ta'ala says that you're going to be tested in your wealth and your lives. And that you're going to hear from those given the scripture before you from the idolaters, not all of them, some of them. So the Jews, the Christians, the Hindus, the idolaters, right? Like the BJP, these other anti-Muslim forces. Evan Kathira, much abuse. So what's happening should strengthen our faith. When people are bombarded with all this anti-Islam, they're ready to leave. Run the faith. I can't take it. They're always talking about us. Their faith gets weakened. Our faith should get strengthened. We should say, this is what the Quran promised. It's true. 
Allahu Akbar. I'm living, I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing the fulfillment of prophecy. I'm, I'm living and experiencing the fulfillment of prophecy. What should that do to the Imam? الذين قال لهم الناس الناس إن الناس قد جمعوا لكم فخشوهم. Those whom the people said to them, the people are gathering against you, fear them. فزادهم إيمانا. It only increased their faith. وقالوا حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل. He said, Allah is sufficient for us. What an excellent. An excellent one to place our trust in. Another verse. This is what Allah promised us, and the messengers have spoken truth. Every time I turn on the radio, here we go again. Mashallah, you're going to hear. Whereas most of it is on the radio. You can dodge it on television. Now you can watch MSNBC instead of Fox. You don't have to listen to it. But when you turn on the radio, Allah says you're going to hear it. Driving into work. Can't get away from it. KPFA. And then Kathira. And then, so what is the methodology of these great prophets? If you patiently persevere, keep doing the good things you're doing and patiently deal with the difficulty that that might involve. And remain mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remain mindful of his commandments and prohibitions so these prophets are called ulul azm and Allah Ta'ala tells us if you follow their way this is azm in your affair you become ulul azm in a sense and the Prophet ﷺ, to emphasize patience as one of the foundations of the way that, of, uh, of their success, فَاصْبِرُ Ya Muhammad, فَاصْبِرُ كَمَا صَبْرَ عُلُوا الْعَزْمِ مِرَا وُفُودِ وَلَا تَسْتَعْجِلْ لَهُمْ Be patient in calling your people as those great messengers who preceded you patiently endured and don't hasten in writing off your people. <coughs> the, so this, 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 there's many messages in here. Number one, to patiently persevere, fossil <coughs> Number two, this is the way of these great messengers. Kama sabara ulul azmi mira rusul. Mina rusul. As those great messengers patiently persevere. So this is their way. Thirdly, and don't be hasty in dismissing your people. Oh, these people, they'll never do this. Oh, they're such captives. Oh, it'll never happen. No. Don't write them off because Allah is in charge, not us. A time will come when what happens? A person will go to bed at night Kafir, wake up as a believer, wake up as a believer, go to bed as a Kafir. So Allah changed, Allah, the affair is with Allah, not with us. So we have to, we have to call our people. This is the final point. We have to be actively involved in doubt. And it might not be, oh, we have a dawah group, we set a table up in the mall. It might be on your job. It might be through your example. But I'm going to be the best Muslim I can be because I know people are looking at me. And so I am, whether I want to or not, I'm either calling 
to Islam with the tongue of my state <coughs> or I'm reposting people and pushing them away from Islam with my state. Our teacher, Sheikh Mustafa Turkmani, used to say, yani, Rajulun, Wahidun, Sahibul Han, Yu'athir al Alf. That one person who has a strong spiritual state can affect a thousand, thousand people. And a thousand people with no real spiritual substance can affect a single individual. So we want to be people of substance, people of significance, people of spiritual weight. And if we are, collectively we'll make a big difference in the world. So, uh, oh yeah, five great challenges to show you. It just made me a bear. I was pacing. I forgot about these. So, inshallah, We meet next Monday. 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 Mm -hmm. Is that possible, folks? No. <coughs> so the five great challenges to Sharia. First is the secularist discourse, and the reason this is a challenge is obvious. This doesn't say that in all affairs, Islam is at odds with secularism. But the fact of the matter is, secularism is at odds with Islam. And specifically meaning that religious principles, religious rulings should have no place in organizing, defining, and shaping society. So politically, economically, culturally even, to a certain extent, there's no place for the principles or rulings of Sharia. So this is problematic because what it ends up doing is stripping away the foundation for a universal set of ethical principles. In other words, if we take God out of the public order. Our economic policies become uh, whoever controls the most wealth controls the economy. Why? Because higher principles related to, uh, to uh, distributive justice have no role in our society. So, as Muslims were told, and Muslims respected these principles, that's why you saw the creation of charitable uh, alqaf, charitable endowments, where people were served in various ways for free. That's why you saw free education. Like, students don't pay to go to al Azhar, and never did. These were endowed institutions. And, and so everything in the public realm devolves into might makes right. Economic might makes right. So how, how can we, uh, through NAFTA, dump all this corn in Iowa on the Mexican economy and destroy the agrarian economy in Mexico and push all of those peasants north? But then we put the wall up. So going south, take the wall down so our corn can go to Mexico. When those displaced farmers want to come to the U.S. to try to eke out a living, we put a wall up. How, 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 how can we do that? Might makes right. Today, what was in the news concerning Mexico and farming? So you listen to the radio while you drive. Or you listen to ESPN. Sports. Radio, Mike and the Mad Dog. 
Well, today they just said the United States is trying to introduce genetically modified corn into the Mexican market, growing in the fields. And corn, you see, you know this stringy, the corn is the most easily cross-pollinated crop. One of the most easily cross-pollinated crop. In other words, all indigenous Mexican corn that's been cultivated and adapted from the time of the Aztecs, the Mixtecs, the Olmecs, will be wiped out within 10 years. How can, how can that happen? Might makes right. There's no higher principles such as the type that are introduced by Sharia. So, actually, let's pray and come back. But don't pray your sunnahs. You have all night to do your sunnahs. We can't have the jama'ah going, and we can hear. If we didn't hear, it's one thing. So let's pray and come back. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So, to quickly, so the secularist discourse is predicated on shirk, on idolatry. And in other words, it sets up multiple sources of law. This nation, this nation, this nation, this nation. It sets up multiple sources of morality. It sub sets up multiple uh, foundations for ethics, and it it has no built-in safeguards to prevent a a an ethic of might makes right economically, politically, and so every and and. Muslims can fall into a lot of the traps that seculars fall into, but by abandoning the Islam, not by being true to its principles. And, and so there are many, many different examples of that, where it might make right. Uh, human rights. Who defines human rights? The powerful who arbitrarily discards human rights even though as they advocate for the powerful. I mean, what happened yesterday in our country? Let's go. With Guantanamo. Oh, yeah. You guys got it. Yeah, <laughs> the the, the uh, National Security Authorization Act that was signed Com contains a provision that makes it impossible for any of the, there are how many, there's still 166 prisoners at Guantanamo. Obama said he's going to close Guantanamo. There are 86 who have been cleared of all charges. CIA, FBI, everyone, no charge, they're innocent. Obama just signed an, an edict that gives them no legal recourse to leave. No, makes it impossible for them to be transferred to this country. Even though they're proven innocent. But where are the human rights in that? The National Security Authorization Act itself allows any one of us on suspicion of aiding a terrorist so you could raise your teenager, he loses his mind, he runs off and joins some jihad group, and then you aided a terrorist. <coughs> you wrote him a letter, please come home, you've lost your mind. And so you, you're giving morale support to a terrorist. You're in jail for the rest of your life with no legal discord. Not the ability to face your accuser. No, no, uh, procedure that will guarantee your trial. No chance for habeas corpus where the court accusing you has to bring the evidence against you or let you go. Anyway, so this is, this is a challenge. 
because it threatens a source of morality that's transcendent and a source of morality that's rooted in a, a single focal point which neglects the plurality and that doesn't advance any particular human interest. So the interest of the wealthy, wealthy is in advance by Sharia to the exclusion of the poor. We're told it's not our wealth. There's zakat. There's uh, sadaqah. There are awqaf, etc. So this is something we should be cognizant of. Pluralism is related to that. So the idea that there is no ultimate truth. This is what I mean by pluralism. Therefore, there's a pl pluralism, plurality of truths. So the challenge to Islam is obvious because in this atmosphere where that uh, philosophy of relative truth becomes increasingly entrenched, the idea of Tawheed is challenged. Our challenge is to, to show that Tawheed provides a stronger basis, foundation, for building a human personality, an integrated human personality. That's our challenge. And to show that Tawheed provides a basis for creating a more realistic uh, outlook on life. And that Tawheed can accommodate the rights of minorities, women, and others that the advocates of pluralism say Islam can accommodate. So this is, this is a challenge. And overcoming that, that's a very long and deep study. So related to that, we mentioned uh, pluralism presenting itself as multiple truths and therefore uh, in those truths there, there's a foundation for pure equality which is a myth in human society even the advocates of pure equality uh, if they have power their power becomes a force of inequality so right now all of this uh, power that's being arraigned against Muslims, the advocates of it say they're for pluralism, they're for multiple truths. But they say your truth as a Muslim isn't covered. Right? Your truth isn't covered. Your truth doesn't count. So, this is, a, this is a big issue. Uh, gender equality. Most of the uh, critiques of Islam are based on the idea that Islam oppresses women. That Muslims don't even let girls go to school. They shoot school girls in the head. And so, again, this is a challenge because you have a lot of ignorant Muslims out there misrepresenting Islam. How do you overcome these challenges? Number one, in terms of secularism, by showing how human life is, is, transcends our physical reality, it transcends our immediate worldly reality. So secularism has nothing to say about the akhirah. So to show that because we believe and understand that our destiny is not just tied to this world, that the Lord who created us before we came into this world and who will ultimately determine the fate of our souls after we leave this world has certain rights over us while we're in this world. And those rights in some instances have political, economic, and social implications. The same thing with pluralism, to show how this multiplicity of truths becomes the foundation of creating a group interest 
that oppress, that immediately lead to the oppression of other groups. Gender equality, by showing them in every area that these attacks, number one, that our Prophet did not encourage those things. The Prophet strove to empower women in the Western sense of the world. But within a context, a societal context, that respects femininity. In other words, gen the whole idea of gender equality can only uh, have any real credence, number one, if we argue there's biological equality. And these are things that people don't like to talk about, that there's biological equality. And so, therefore, uh, duties of parenting are totally equal. So we negate the fact that the mother has the milk. Total equality. So we eliminate the biological function. We eliminate the spiritual, fun uh, spiritual differences in the sense that there are spiritual qualities that women possess, that men don't possess. And historically, one way we've understood that was the, by women's intuition. So this is a non-physical quality historically associated with women, but we eliminate that. So then we can propose a scheme of everyone does the same thing, everyone dresses the same. Men wear pants and sweatshirts. Women wear pants and sweatshirts. Men operate jackhammers. <laughs> women operate jackhammers. Men drive trucks. Women drive trucks. And we mentioned in the past how this whole idea has nothing to do with equality. And it comes back to might makes right is men imposing their ideals on women. So things men have historically done, like driving trucks or operating jackhammers or playing baseball, women do. And wearing pants and sweatshirts and sweatbands even on the head. Women do. Things women have historically done do men do? Do men wear dresses? You might have a few. As it, but generally, women wear pants, right? Here in the West, generally, nowadays. Generally, do men wear dresses? No. Women play basketball now and softball. Same uniform the men have. Do men generally play with baby dolls? Men might play with G.I. Joe. But do men, or uh, boys, the boys take the little baby. This is my baby. No. Do men stay home? You have an occasional house spouse, but out of choice, not necessity. Some men are unemployed and their wives have to work. But generally, do men stay home? No, they don't. So the things, even, even after great equi uh, initiatives at equality, do men wash dishes, sisters, on a regular basis? Oh, you have a good husband. Generally speaking, do men wash dishes? Generally, there are some exceptional brothers out there. I will bust a few suds myself, occasionally, but on a regular basis. So where's the equality in this arrangement? Where's the equality in this arrangement? Is men who have power imposing their ideals on women, and women out of a sense of inferiority only feeling I can have real value if I do the things men do. There's no equality in that. 
And so the challenge for Islam is to show the beauty in femininity and masculinity. Well, they said, untha, And to show the beauty in complementariness. We complement each other like a hand and a glove. So this is the challenge for Muslims. The nation state is a challenge because the nation state fragments the Muslim Ummah. So the potential of the Ummah as an alternative institution, as the foundation for our alternative ways of organizing people becomes negated. And the potential of Muslims undermine. Also the nation state in its current formulation is idolatrous because the nation state allows no higher form of allegiance in theory. That's idolatry. So we're loyal citizens, we're faithful citizens, but we're not idolaters. We're not idolaters. And so this presents a challenge because the influence of the nation state is pervasive even in the Muslim world. This is a challenge. And as the nation state uh, becomes increasingly corrupt, in other words, it becomes as opposed to being a rallying point that provides benefit to all of its members, as it becomes increasingly corrupt, it becomes an institution that preserves entrenched privileges for small oligarchies. So in other words, the army doesn't go to war to protect you and me. The army goes to war to protect big oil. The army goes to, to war to give contracts to Kellogg, Brown and Root and Halliburton. Billion dollar contracts. It doesn't go to war to protect me or you. So the, the Treasury doesn't uh, use our tax dollars to advance our interests. It uses our tax dollars to advance the interests of Wall Street. You know, when I get fall upon hard times, I'm not bailed out. You're not bailed out. You lost your home if you got foreclosed on. No one bailed you out. But they bailed out Wall Street with not billions, trillions of dollars. Just the TARP money was the 700 billion, but over and beyond TARP. So the nation state, as it becomes increasingly corrupt, serves the interest of the oligarchies that control it, and not the interest of all of its citizens. So as Muslims, where's the challenge? We have to show that and the nation state also, as it becomes more corrupt, seeks to preserve those interests to the exclusion of others. And this is why we should critique the idea of the nation state. Because the, 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 the fact that nations in Africa or Asian or parts of Latin America are so underdeveloped, there's a reason for it. And it's rooted in the fact that there are nations that are sucking that wealth out. So we have to say no. We have to have a scheme that sees us all as citizens of a, of a world where we all have equal right to those resources that we possess. And those resources, first and foremost, should be used for our benefit and not for the benefit of some corporate or national interest that's divorced from where we are. So we have, to, we have to critique this, otherwise the same old garbage will keep repeating itself. Or Chad, now there's, there's a, no that's the Central African Republic, but Chad is a mineral, minerally rich land. Most of that wealth is going to France, particularly 
Why is that? Why isn't that wealth staying in check? Because there are conflicting national interests, and in this competition amongst nations, again, the powerful are the winners. We have to say no. The powerless should have first priority. That's Abu Bakr, right? When Abu Bakr assumed the Khilafah, at da'ifu fikum qawiyun indi hatta akhudha lahu haqqa. The one weak with you is strong with me until I secure the right owed to him or her. Well, qawi yu fikum da'ifun indi hatta akhudha minhu al-haq, insha'Allah. And the one strong with you is weak with me until I take from him the rights owed to others, if Allah so wills. So we have to rethink and show through, in small ways, the virtue of our political morality as Muslims. And bring that to bear in, a, in addressing many of the issues that we see uh, confronting <coughs> our world. Otherwise, the powerful Allah Ta'ala is real. Now, who has the biggest carbon footprint on earth? Now, Australia. What's happening in Australia right now? Burning. It's burning. 130 degree temperatures. <coughs> fires everywhere. What else did they start doing? Killing the camels. Mm. This is a sign of Allah Ta'ala. أَفَلَا يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبَلِ كَيْفَ خُلِقَتْ Do they not look at the camel, how it was created? So we will, we know Allah is real, and sooner or later, Dr. Martin Luther King would frequently say, "The moral arc of the universe is Martin Luther King week." <laughs> People, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Sooner or later. Going to come back, inshallah. Oops. And then global finance, globalized finance, sets a, a structure in place that disproport that disadvantages the poor. So, as Muslims, and this is something we could start uh, in in uh, thing Manchester, Leeds, in England, they started circulating their own local currency. So the multiplier effect of that money stays in their community. We have to begin to develop local economic uh, schemes. There might be currency, food co-ops. Right? MCC, MCC, any officiados? Start a food co-op. You have all this space. Let's start a food co-op. So we can buy in bulk and then cut down drastically on our food costs. These are the kind of things we can do. Local economic initiatives as a way to begin challenging the power of globalized finance. So these are great challenges. And again, why? Uh, challenge for Sharia, Sharia as we know, no interest. Globalized finance is based on, predicated on, built on interest. So we have to begin to question that. And we have to begin to slowly develop alternatives to the best of our ability. And that requires all of us. All of us, we can start our own bank. We can start schemes. There are enough Muslims. How many Muslims are in the Bay? I've heard more. Yes, young man. How many? <laughs> Why did you raise your hand? Are you just exercising? One, two, three, four. Give us a guess. You raise your hand. Just make up a number. So you said 250,000? I've heard that number, mashallah. 
be a smart young man. I've heard that number batted around the entire Bay Area. <coughs> Let's say if there were. If, if half of those, the 100,000, less than half, were contributing $100 to a housing fund every month, how much money would that be? <coughs> we're the non-mathematically challenged. <laughs> Two hundred, a hundred thousand people, a hundred dollars a month would be ten million dollars. Ten million dollars a month. How many houses in the current market could we buy with ten million dollars? No, you could buy far more. Than that. Ten houses. A million each. Now you could buy more than that. Let's say twenty, five hundred thousand. That's reasonable. 20 houses a month. How many houses a year? And in 10 years, how many houses? 2,400, 2,500. How many? 2,400. Now, what if we were paying $200 a month? You double that. We could, we could put a lot of Muslims in houses. <coughs> and any one Muslim would only be paying $200 a month, and we buy buying these houses cash. And then those who receive the houses, since they're spared any mortgage payment, any rent payment, they could pay maybe $500, which they gladly do, and could easily do. And so think of the economic strength we could, we could develop. And all of it is no interest, but it takes all of us. And that's the challenge. You know, the challenge is for us to bring our, in every one of these areas, to educate ourselves. How do we respond to these attacks on Islam, attacks on Sharia, Shiraz, this or that? You know, how do we equip our, our people with knowledge? How do you respond to these, when these miscarriages of justice, they say, oh, Sharia, they stoned this girl. She was raped and they punished her. And then the Muslims are like, uh, it's like the, the majority of the Shafi, Hanbali, and Hanafi schools, uh, pregnancy is not a proof for fornication. Because <clears throat> the, the woman could have been raped, etc. It's not, it's not a hujjah at all. So to show this is a miscarriage of justice, this isn't Sharia. And, and then put it in a comparative con a context. We err. When we just look at attack on Islam in isolation. So you say, wait a minute. This is a miscarriage of justice. The Sharia is implemented by human beings. They can err. But what about our system? How many have heard of the Innocence Project? when using DNA evidence over 100 people who are, who are convicted of capital murder and were on death row have been exonerated. Over 100. To such an extent, several states have now eliminated the death penalty because there's so much doubt as to the actual guilt of people being accused of capital murder. What about those mis miscarriages of justice? Troy Davis, how many of you are familiar with the Troy Davis case? Let's say, uh, well, that, that's a miscarriage of justice. That's not Sharia. Is, it, is, is the Troy Davis case uh, illustrative of the quality of our judicial system? Where a guy is framed by the police, <coughs> Seven of nine witnesses recant their testimony. There's no physical evidence whatsoever linking this individual to the crime. It's all circumstantial. And the people providing the circumstantial evidence, they said, no, the cops forced us to say that. They threatened us. 
and he gets executed anyway? You know. How do you explain that? So we should we should always equip ourselves with knowledge to put these things in a comparative framework. So that it can be some basis of coming to some sort of a value judgment as to what might be superior or not. Allah almost died. You know, I know a person who was committed of capital murder in Connecticut. Muslim convert. On the basis of the testimony of a a prostitute was a known police informant. Sharia, that person couldn't be a witness. Number one, she didn't witness the crime. She allegedly witnessed him throwing a jacket that allegedly had the DNA of the victim in a dumpster. The jacket didn't even fit the accused. But he was convicted anyway on that testimony. Prostitute, drug addict, known police <coughs> informant. Whereas that would, that would not be acceptable in a Shari court. This is well known. But unless we began to bring our principles, our ideals to the fore, that will be lost to people, and then this void where we're not presenting information, we're not pre presenting counter-arguments, we're not pre presenting any meaningful context, everything gets lost and distorted. 